Jazara Thompson. On the night of November 16th, 2015, Raquel Thompson went to pick up her boyfriend, Cornell Malone, from work. She left her four children alone in the Houston apartment complex where they lived. The children were all under the age of five, with the youngest child, Jazara, being just 19 months old. On their return 30 minutes later, Thompson and Malone found that the children were still asleep in their beds. At around 10 p.m., they decided to go out again and leave the children unattended, despite the fact that their grandmother lived in the same complex and could have watched them. The couple went to Domino's Pizza, picked up a prescription from a Walgreens pharmacy, and spent some time with Thompson's brother before returning to the apartment at around midnight. They were met by a horrific sight. Jazara was lying on the kitchen floor next to the oven. She was suffering from severe burns. Thompson immediately called the paramedics and began to try and resuscitate her youngest daughter, but it was too late. Jazara died at the scene. After speaking to the other children, police were able to determine that for an unknown reason, the eldest child had decided to put Jazara in the oven, while another turned it on to full. The three-year-old involved told Child Protective Services that they had put Jazara in the oven and made it hot. Thompson was seven months pregnant at the time and also had an older child who lived with their father. The family were known to Child Protection Services, although it was not deemed necessary to remove the child before the incident. On the morning of the tragedy, Thompson's ex-boyfriend, Frederick Price, came looking for his children. He claimed to be the father to at least two of them and had not seen them in months because he did not know where they were. He had been trying to find Raquel and only found out where she was living when he saw it on the news. Price was unsure whether Jazara was his daughter or not because he had never taken a paternity test, although he did say that she was a cute baby. Despite the involvement of Price and Thompson's mother, the other three children were placed in foster care, as it was decided that none of their relatives were suitable to take care of them. Both Thompson and Malone were charged with four counts of child endangerment. Later, Thompson was given a 12-year sentence for abandoning a child under the age of 15. Corazon Atinza. Richard Speck was born in Kirkwood, Illinois. He was the seventh of eight children. Speck's family was extremely religious and his father died when he was just six years old. His mother remarried and the family relocated to Dallas, Texas. His new stepfather was an alcoholic who mentally abused Speck with threats and insults. Speck began drinking at just 12 and by the age of 15, he too was an alcoholic. He was first arrested at the age of 15 for trespassing, followed by several arrests throughout his teenage years for other misdemeanors. By July of 1966, Richard Speck was now 21 years old and had a criminal record for forgery, burglary, and aggravated assault. But for one reason or another, he always seemed to evade a lengthy sentence. In April of that year, he stayed in Monmouth, Illinois with friends. There, he tied up and raped Virgil Harris, a 65-year-old woman at knife point, after breaking into her house. He was only able to steal a few dollars that she had earned from babysitting that night. A week later, he murdered Mary Pierce, a 32-year-old barmaid, when he hit her so hard in the stomach that she ruptured her liver. He was questioned about the incident by police and told not to leave town, but fled to his sister's apartment in Chicago. After three months, it was agreed that he would leave and he moved to a rooming house. On the night of July 13th, he sexually assaulted 53-year-old Ella May Hooper in his room before going to a townhouse in the Jeffrey Manor neighborhood at 11 p.m. The house served as a dormitory for eight student nurses who worked at the South Chicago Communal Hospital. Wondering who could be knocking on the door so late, 23-year-old Corazon, or Cora, as she was known to her friends, went to answer it. She found a tall young man standing there. He was dressed all in black, had a pock marked face, and his hair was greasy and slicked back. The man smelled strongly of drink, and he pushed his way past Cora and into the house. With the threat of a knife and the gun stolen from Ella May, Speck herded all of the women together into one room. He promised that he would not hurt them, and said he just needed money to get to New Orleans. Speck then proceeded to systematically remove each nurse from the room before sexually assaulting them and stabbing and strangling them one by one. All of the women were killed that night, and were aged between just 20 and 24 years old. Unbeknown to Speck, there was another girl at the house that night. Although he had pushed past her at the door, Speck failed to notice that Cora was missing from the room. 
She had crawled under one of the beds and hidden there whilst the horror was taking place. Too afraid to move and barely daring to even breathe, Cora stayed in her hiding place until 6am, long after Speck had fled the scene. She then climbed out to the window ledge of the bedroom and began to scream for help. Three days later, Speck was taken to Cook County Hospital after he had tried to commit suicide. The doctor who treated him had just been on a break and had read a newspaper that showed a photograph of the killer. The doctor also recognized a tattoo that matched the newspaper's description. Although terrified, Cora was brave enough to walk over to Speck and identify him in court. She was kept under police protection for a year before the trial and learned to play poker with the police detectives that guarded her. Speck was found guilty of eight counts of murder and sentenced to death. Although this was later commuted to a jail term of between 400 and 1,200 years. After the trial, Cora moved back to the Philippines where she married before returning to the US and working in Washington DC as a critical care nurse. She has two children and six grandchildren and appreciates every day that she is alive. Cora moved on with her life and has tried to be happy every day. Cora wonders why she was spared but believes there was somebody up there who was hiding her from Speck, stating that God was so nice. Although she will never forget her friends that died or the horror of that night, she still has nightmares that he will come back and kill her, even though Speck died in prison from a heart attack in 1991. A truly tragic story. Barbara Foster. In February 2017, Emergency services were called to an address in Lucas County, Ohio. When people walking past the house began to complain about the smell of excrement, firefighters had to wear hazmat suits before they could enter the house of Barbara Foster, who was 75. Although neighbors in the local area of Springfield Township said they looked out for one another, the man who had lived next door to Barbara for a decade admitted he had not seen her for years. He said he used to wave to her regularly and she was known around town as a hoarder and recluse. A man from Barbara's local church had visited regularly, bringing food parcels for years. He said that he didn't even notice the stench anymore, because he had just become accustomed to it, although the emergency services said that the smell was overpowering. He noticed that Barbara was in low spirits and feeling unwell, so he called 911. The firefighters were shocked to find Barbara who was five feet five and weighed 550 pounds, stuck in an armchair. She had been sitting there for months and was surrounded by a pile of her own feces and urine. Apparently, she had been unable to move for seven months. When the emergency services were unable to get her out of the chair, they noticed that her skin had become fused to it and had grown over the fabric. She had become molded to the armchair. Mrs. Foster had become so physically weak that her bones began to break as the emergency services tried to lift her from the chair. The house was condemned as being unfit for habitation because of the human waste found there. Barbara was taken to the University of Toledo Medical Center, but she later died. After a review of the case, the Lucas County Sheriff's Office decided that no crime had been committed and the case was considered closed. Spider House, Missouri. In October of 2007, Brian and Susan Trost found their dream home. Their new house overlooked the exclusive Whitmore Country Club golf course in Wilden Springs, Missouri. With 2,400 square feet of space and four bedrooms, the house cost the couple $450,000. After moving in, Susan Trost noticed that there were a lot of spider webs in the property, especially around the light fittings and in the basement, but she decided that the house just needed a thorough clean but it soon became apparent that the house was infested when the family began finding spiders everywhere, hanging from ceilings and lights and crawling up blinds and in fireplaces. One night when Susan was taking a shower, one even dropped from the ceiling and just missed landing in her hair before it was swept down the drain. The spiders were literally seeping out of the wall cavities. The Tross caught one of the spiders and after doing some research on the net, they realized that they were dealing with a brown recluse these spiders are from the same species as the black widow and use necrotic venom when biting their prey. Symptoms from a bite can be as mild as pain, swelling and itching at the puncture site, as well as nausea. Organ failure or death has been reported in extreme cases. 
By 2012, the problem had gotten so bad that an expert from the University of Kansas estimated that the troughs were sharing their home with between 4,500 and 6,000 spiders, and that was just during the winter season. Two extermination companies sprayed behind the drywall, placed pesticide in the attic area, and laid traps, but were unable to eradicate the spiders. The troughs filed a claim with their insurance company and took up a lawsuit against the vendors who had sold the property to them without disclosing the spider problem. The previous owners stated that they never saw any spiders, and their lawyer insinuated that the troughs had unbeknowingly brought the spiders into the homes themselves. Nevertheless, the civil trial jury voted in the troughs' favor, and the couple were awarded over $470,000 in compensation. But the former owners claimed bankruptcy, so none of the money was ever paid. The insurance company refused to pay, stating that the spiders had not caused any physical damage within the home. So, fearing for the safety of their four children, the Tross felt that they had no other option other than to leave what was once their dream home. They left their furniture outside in freezing temperatures before the move in the hope that that would kill any spiders that were hiding in there. The house went into foreclosure in 2014 after being left empty for two years, and the mortgage company employed a pest control firm to deal with the problem. The house was covered in nine tarpaulins, which measured over 15,000 square feet, before being filled with a poisonous sulfury chloride gas. This gas was able to permeate the walls and kill both the spiders and their eggs. Apparently, the earlier attempts to eradicate the swarm did not work because pesticides do not kill spiders, as their feet are unable to absorb substances. Arachnid experts have no idea why the spiders chose to infest that particular house without invading any others in the area. The Tross neighbors reported that they had never had any problems with spiders in their homes. Although bugs can be unknowingly carried into the home from other places, such as in furniture bought at auction or brought from storage. Any items of furniture that are introduced in that way should be thoroughly checked first. But can you just imagine sharing your home with up to 6,000 spiders? Pedro Alonso Lopez Pedro Alonso Lopez shared a familiar trait, common to a lot of serial killers. He had a horrific childhood. He was born in 1948 in Santa Isabel, Colombia, and was a middle child of 13. His father, Madaro Rees, was a supporter of a right-wing party, and he was killed during the first year of Colombia's 10-year civil war, known as La Violencia. His mother, Benilda, was three months pregnant with Lopez at the time. From an early age, Lopez watched his mother perform sex acts for money, and often witnessed her being assaulted by clients. Lopez claimed his mother was also physically abusive. Obviously affected by this trauma, he was caught indecently touching one of his sisters when he was just eight years old, so his mother threw him out to wander the streets. He made his way towards the capital city of Bogota, where he joined the many other street children, or gamies, who searched out food in Bogota's refuse bins. Lopez joined a gang and began smoking a highly addictive form of cocaine, known as basuco. Lopez claims he was abducted and raped by a man during this time. At the age of 10, he was helped by an American family who took him in and were able to get him enrolled in a school for orphans. But at age 12, he was sexually assaulted by a teacher, so he ran away. Now on the streets again, by the age of 18, he was arrested for stealing cars. In prison, he was gang raped, but he hunted each rapist down and killed them, one by one, using an improvised knife known as a shiv. After his release from prison, Lopez traveled to Peru, where he began to lure young girls to remote areas, where he would assault and murder them. By 1978, he had killed at least 100 girls between the ages of 9 and 12. He said, I walked among the market searching for a girl with a certain look on her face, a look of innocence and beauty. She would be a good girl. I followed her for two or three days, waiting for the moment when she was left alone. He was caught trying to kidnap a nine-year-old girl by members of the indigenous Ayacucho community. They submitted him to tribal law and he was sentenced to be buried alive. But a missionary convinced the tribe to turn him over to the Peruvian police. He did not stand trial. Instead, he was deported back to Colombia where he was able to continue his killings. By the late 1970s, Lopez had gone to Ecuador, and by 1980, in the Ambato province, dozens of young girls were missing, and the locals were desperately trying to find out what was happening to them. 
Lopez later claimed that by this point, he was killing around three girls every week. He said that Ecuadorian girls were more gentle and trusting, more innocent. He was finally caught again when he tried to lure the daughter of Kalina Raman from a busy marketplace, and the stall holders were able to surround and detain him. Once in custody, Lopez refused to cooperate. He was tricked by an undercover police officer who posed as an inmate. Lopez confessed to the murders and gave a detailed account of the burial site. Because of this information, police found over 50 bodies and coupled with the confession, Lopez was charged with 110 murders, to which he pleaded guilty. He was assessed by psychiatrists and officially diagnosed as a sociopath. In 1981, he was found guilty of only three of the murders, although he had confessed to over 300 sexual assaults and strangulations. Shockingly, Lopez only received a maximum sentence of 16 years in prison because of Ecuadorian law. Lopez served time at the Garcia Moreno prison in Quito for just 14 years before he was released for good behavior. In 1994, he was once again deported to Colombia. He was declared insane and detained at a psychiatric hospital in Bogota. After being declared sane in 1998, he was released under conditional bail of just $50. Lopez, known as the Monster of the Andes, absconded and at present, his whereabouts are unknown. A Guinness World Record listing that declared him the world's most prolific serial killer has since been removed, as it was declared that the entry was making a competition out of a murderer. Pedro Alonso Lopez, a man who killed over 100 people, if still alive, is walking the streets to this day. Tom and Eileen, Lone Again in January 1998, husband and wife Tom and Eileen were returning from a Peace Corps mission in Fiji, heading home to Hawaii. Both were experienced divers and decided they couldn't pass up the chance of diving at the Great Barrier Reef. So on January 25th, they boarded the outer edge boat that took them and a group of other tourists 40 miles out to sea, where they visited three dive sites, the last being a place named Fish City. The pair were experienced divers and were comfortable going off on their own in the water. However, when they resurfaced from their dive, to their horror, their dive boat had departed without them, leaving them all alone bobbing in the vast ocean. It is standard practice for dive excursion to do a head count before heading back to shore, but on this occasion, something went drastically wrong. None of the vessel's crew or passengers noticed the two had not come back aboard, until two days later, when the boat owner looked in a bag that had been left behind that day by a passenger. Immediately, alarm bells started to ring when he discovered Tom's wallet. A rescue team was immediately sent out and extensive searches were made, but sadly, the couple were never seen again. Their bodies assumed to be lost at sea. Like other nightmarish experiences, Tom and Eileen's story was turned into a film called Open Water that depicted the couple meeting their end, circled by sharks. But the true story is much scarier, simply because no one really knows what happened to them. Over the years, a lot of information has come out about their lives and the circumstances that led to them being abandoned. Several weeks after they were reported missing, pieces of their diving gear washed up on shore, including inflatable jackets with their names on, air tanks, and a woman's wetsuit. However, none of the items had any signs of blood or holes that would be consistent with a shark attack. What was strange was why the Lonergans had removed the jacket that would help to keep them afloat. It's theorized they may have taken them off in an attempt to swim to shore, although without the buoyancy of their jackets, they would have likely worn themselves out to the point of exhaustion. One of the most chilling things was discovered six months after they disappeared, when a dive slate was discovered by a fisherman. A dive slate is used by divers so they can communicate underwater, they are basically small boards where information and messages can be written. The dive slate found by the fisherman was dated January 26th, 1998, with a time of 8 a.m. and a message that read, please help us or we will die. The distress note appears to indicate the loner gangs were still alive, at least until the next day. Also discovered at the couple's home were diaries that both Tom and Eileen had kept, and some of the entries indicated all was not well in their lives. They wrote about hating their jobs, and eerily, Eileen felt her husband had developed a death wish. Tom's diary appeared to back this up, with an entry that read, Like a student who has finished an exam, 
I feel that my life is complete and I am ready to die. These revelations led to suggestions. The couple were either carrying out a suicide pact or were the victims of a murder-suicide at the hands of Tom. Another strange theory emerged while police were investigating the case. The captain of another boat claimed to have visited the same dive spot the next day and may have encountered the couple. According to his story, the head count before the vessel's return trip came out two more than the one taken when the boat left port. Apparently the tourists on the boat were all from Italy and spoke in their native tongue. However, the captain remembers hearing a few American voices among the tourists that day. If this account is true, it could indicate the Lonergans planned to spend the night in the ocean, knowing they could join another dive boat the next day, leading to claims the Lonergans faked their own death. This theory was later reinforced when more than 20 people came forward, claiming to have seen the Lonergans after they supposedly disappeared. However, considering they both left their passports behind, never touched their bank accounts after the incident, and their insurance policies were never cashed in, this does seem a bit far-fetched. Some have questioned why the Lonergans didn't swim to one of the well-lit diving platforms a few miles away or flag down a passing ship, although it's been pointed out that although these things would be easily visible from the deck of a boat, they may not have been easily seen from the surface of the water. Tom had also left his glasses on board, making it even more difficult for him to see. In addition, it's highly likely the Lonergans were in a state of panic. They had been left completely alone, and as hours ticked by, they must have realized their boat wasn't returning for them, and there was no active rescue underway. Coupled this with the heat from the sun and lack of fresh drinking water, they were likely in a bad way. No one knows what happened to the Lonergans, and it's hard to imagine being in that situation, totally alone surrounded by a shark-infested ocean. It seems unlikely that they were eaten by sharks, as though half of the world's sharks live in the waters around Australia, most of them are completely harmless to humans. All the evidence seems to point to the Lonergans becoming exhausted and drowning. Clearly mistakes were made by the boat owner, and after he was acquitted of manslaughter, a civil case was brought against him and the business closed. Stricter laws on how dive companies operate and how headcounts are taken have also been enforced. It's horrific to think they likely lived for at least 48 hours alone in the ocean. The case is sad because unless they intentionally faked their own death, which seems unlikely, this shouldn't have happened. Ron and Dan Lafferty Ron and Dan Lafferty were raised in a large dysfunctional family in Orem, Utah. Ron was the eldest of eight children that consisted of six boys and two girls. They were all brought up in a strict Mormon family and their father was a stern disciplinarian who sometimes took out his rage on the family. On one occasion, he beat the family dog to death with a baseball bat. As well as being a disciplinarian, he was also a conspiracy theorist who taught his children to distrust conventional medicine and the federal government. As Ron and Dan grew up, they became very close and both carried their father's extreme beliefs into adulthood. Dan in particular thought he was well above the law and was often in trouble for refusing to pay taxes or obey traffic laws. Both men married and continued to be active members of the church. However, eventually, Dan became disgruntled with the Mormon church when it abandoned polygamy, the practice of taking more than one wife, and he joined a splinter group called the School of the Prophets. Ron soon followed his younger brother into the movement after being excommunicated from the Mormon church in 1983. The School of the Prophets taught how to receive relations from God, and soon all six Lafferty brothers joined the movement and all of them were spending a lot of time together, railing against the Mormon church and the US government, much to the annoyance of their wives. Dan and Ron also declared to the group that they were prophets and both men started sporting an unkept appearance with long beards. Eventually, Ron's wife left him. She objected to his bizarre and twisted views and refused to practice polygamy. Ron was bereft and deeply depressed after she left and spent his days and nights writing what he believed would one day be a scripture. But his anguish at the breakup of his marriage soon turned into rage and he blamed three people, Chloe Lowe, a former Mormon Relief Society president who had supported his wife during the divorce, Richard Stowe, the Highland Mormon stake president who had presided over his excommunication, 
and Brenda Wright Lafferty, the strong-willed wife of his youngest brother, Alan. Brenda was a former beauty queen and a college graduate. She was confident and not afraid to speak up. She didn't believe Ron or Dan were prophets, and she told them as much. She also objected to their fundamentalist belief in polygamy, and when Alan started to be influenced by Dan and Ron's beliefs, she fought back and stopped him attending the meetings. Ron's anger towards Brenda grew in his mind. She had driven away his wife, and now she was splitting up the brothers. He later claimed he had a revelation that God told him that Brenda needed to be removed, along with her infant daughter. Ron shared his revelation with the School of Prophets members on what he called the removal revelation list. Chloe Lowe and Richard Stowe were also on it. This is what he wrote. Thus saint the Lord, unto my servants the prophets, it is my will and commandment that ye remove the following individuals in order that my work might go forward. For they have truly become obstacles in my path and I will not allow my work to be stopped. First thy brother's wife Brenda and her baby, then Chloe Lowe and then Richard Stowe. And it is my will that they be removed in rapid succession. On the afternoon of July 24th, 1984, Ron and his brother Dan set out to fulfill the revelation. Driving a battered green station wagon, they drove to Alan and Brenda's home in American Fork, Utah, carrying with them guns and knives. The two bearded men entered the house where they beat and strangled Brenda with a vacuum cleaner cord before slashing her and baby Erica's throat with a knife. Both men were soon arrested for the crime. In court, Dan represented himself and was found guilty and sentenced to five years to life. After psychiatric evaluation, Ron was found to be fit to stand trial and was also tried and convicted in 1985. He was sentenced to death. After years of unsuccessful appealing on grounds of mental capability, Ron elected to be executed by firing squad. However, in 2019, Ron died in Salt Lake City State Prison, age 78. Had he lived, he was due to be executed the following year. His brother Dan still languishes in the maximum security wing of Utah State Prison, and over the years has spoken in graphic detail about what he did to his sister-in-law and baby niece. A book called Under the Banner of Heaven, A Story of Violent Faith, was written about the brothers based on interviews Dan gave. Dan remains to this day unrepentant, still believing all organized religion is of the devil. He doesn't believe he will die in prison. He believes the walls will crumble and he will emerge as the biblical prophet Elia, announcing the second coming of Christ. The Nepropetrovsk Maniacs this case was suggested by one of our patrons. It was committed in Ukraine by three friends who went on a three-week killing spree during which they killed over 20 innocent people. Viktor Sayanko, Igor Sopranyuk, and Alexander Hanza were all born in 1988 to wealthy influential parents and attended school together in Nepropetrovsk, Ukraine. They all suffered from various phobias which they tried to overcome by doing strange activities, such as hanging over the railing of balconies to combat their fear of height, and torturing and killing stray dogs and cats to cure a fear of blood. After leaving school, Sayenko and Hansa got jobs, while Sopranyuk became an unlicensed taxi driver. To make extra money, the three teenagers started robbing taxi passengers. However, eventually, Sayenko and Sopranyuk lost interest in robbing and decided to move on to murders in a three-week killing spree between June and July 2007, they randomly selected victims who happened to be out walking. After creeping up on their victims, they mercilessly bludgeoned them to death with blunt instruments, such as hammers and steel bars. They often killed more than one person in a day, beating them so badly that they would be almost unrecognizable. Some of the victims were also tortured and mutilated. They then recorded and photographed their dead victims posing with them as if they had been out hunting. They were eventually caught after a survivor, 14-year-old Vadmin Lyakov, ran to the police after his friend was murdered by the pair. Initially, Vadmin was blamed for the killing. However, it quickly became clear that he was not responsible and his sketches of the perpetrators helped to identify them. The three 19-year-olds were charged with involvement in 29 separate incidents, including 21 murders and eight more attacks where victims survived. 
Sopranyuk was charged with 27 other cases, including 21 counts of capital murder, 8 armed robberies, and 1 count of animal cruelty. Sienko was also charged with 25 instances, including 18 murders, 5 robberies, and 1 count of animal cruelty, and Hansa was charged with 2 counts of armed robbery, as he never participated in any of the murders. Sopranyuk and Sienko were both sentenced to life imprisonment, while Hansa was sentenced to 9 years. No motive has ever been established, although local media reported the killers had a plan to get rich from showing the murders on the internet. In April 2019, it was reported that Alexander Hansa had been released from prison after serving nine years and is now married and living with his wife and two children somewhere in Ukraine. The devastating story of John Edward Jones at age 26, John Edward Jones was in the prime of his life. He was married, he had a one-year-old daughter, and was attending medical school in Virginia. In November 2009, John had travelled back to his hometown in Utah to spend with his friends and family. John and his brother Josh had been keen cavers as kids, along with nine other friends and family members, and decided to explore Nutty Putty Cave, a notoriously tricky hydrothermal cave formation located just west of Utah Lake. The group set off on the evening of November the 24th. About an hour into the expedition, John decided to find the Nutty Putty Cave Formation known as the Birth Canal, a very tight passage that experienced Splunkers needed to carefully crawl through. It had been years since John had been in a cave, and at 6 feet tall and 200 pounds, he wasn't the little kid who used to easily crawl into caves with his father. Despite this, John pushed on, entering the narrow opening head first carefully shuffling along using his hips, stomach and fingers. However, it soon became apparent he was stuck. He had squeezed in so tightly, he had no room to turn around and no room to back out. He tried to push on, but just made things worse. He was stuck in a space that was barely 10 inches across and 18 inches high. Josh was the first to find John and tried to pull his brother out by grabbing his legs. However, this made things worse as John slid down into the passage even further and his arms were now pinned underneath his chest and he couldn't move at all. All the brothers, who were devout Mormons, could do at this point was pray. Josh called for help, but because John was trapped 400 feet into the cave and 100 feet below the surface, getting rescuers' equipment and supplies down that far took over an hour. The first rescuer to reach John was a woman named Susie Motola, who arrived just after midnight on November 25th. By this time, John had been stuck for three and a half hours. All Susie could see was a pair of navy and black running shoes. Time was running out for John. The downward angle at which he was trapped was putting huge stress on his body, and his blood was struggling to pump around, and he was having some difficulty breathing. At one point, rescuers brought a two-way cable radio into the cave, and managed to lower it to John so he could speak with his wife. They were both understandably upset, but able to comfort each other. Over the next 24 hours, more than 100 rescue workers tried to free John, but after everything failed to budge him, they decided to use a system of pulleys and ropes. They tied John to a rope connected to a series of pulleys. When everything was in place, they pulled as hard as they could, working in an eight-man tandem. John was at times in great pain, but slowly but surely he started to move, until he was finally high enough to make eye contact with one of the rescuers. They even managed a short conversation, John was almost out. Then suddenly, without warning, one of the pulleys failed after coming loose from its anchor point in the cave wall. The entire team fell backwards as the rope suddenly went loose. Once the dust had settled, the rescuers realized John had slid right down the crevice again, this time seemingly even deeper than before. There was now no hope of rescue, and John's heart could take no more after hours of strain due to his downward position. Sadly, John was pronounced dead of cardiac arrest shortly before midnight on the evening of November 25th, 2009. Rescuers had heroically spent 27 hours trying to save him. His family thanked them for their help, even despite the tragic news. After John's death, officials sealed off Nutty Putty K for good. They never recovered his body, which remains inside to this day. John's family had a plaque put on the entrance of the cave in his memory and Nutty Putty Cave now serves as a national memorial and gravesite to John Edward Jones.
In 2016, filmmaker Isaac Halasima produced and directed a full-length feature film about the life and failed rescue of John Jones, called The Last Descent. It gives an accurate and terrifying insight into the ordeal John suffered. Anatoly Moskvin Anatoly Moskvin was a smart guy. He spoke 13 languages, travelled extensively, and was a published scholar and college lecturer. He also had a dubious reputation as being an expert on cemeteries, as he knew everything there was to know about the cemeteries in his city, Nizhdi Novgorod, Russia. Moskvin claimed that between 2005 and 2007, he visited 752 cemeteries and delved into the histories of those buried there. He attributed his obsession with the macabre to a 1979 incident when he was 13 and a group of men in black suits stopped him on the way home from school. They were en route to the funeral of 11-year-old Natasha Petrova and allegedly dragged young Moskvin to her coffin where they forced him to kiss the girl's corpse. Moskin even claimed he spent one night sleeping in a coffin ahead of a deceased person's funeral to add to his observations. However, it seems at one point, this obsession with death spilled over. In 2009, locals began to discover the graves of their loved ones desecrated or completely dug up. Initially, authorities thought it was done by some extremist organizations, so they increased police units in the affected areas. But after nearly two years, they found nothing and graves continued to be desecrated. They then got a break following a terrorist attack at a Moscow airport in 2011. Shortly afterwards, Muslim graves in the area started being vandalized. Someone was painting over the pictures of dead Muslims. Further investigations led them to Moskvin, who was caught red-handed at the graves. Police later searched his home, a small apartment he shared with his parents, and what they found was shocking. The apartment was full of life-sized, doll-like figures. The figures resembled antique dolls. They were dressed in fine clothing, and some wore knee-high boots and had makeup on their cloth-covered faces. Except these were not dolls, they were mummified corpses of human girls. Take a look at this footage, but be warned, it is disturbing. Inside the chest of many of the dolls, Moskvin had weirdly embedded music boxes, so when he lifted them up, they played music. Investigators also found photographs and plaques taken from gravestones, as well as doll-making manuals and maps of local cemeteries. There were also personal belongings and clothing inside some of the mummies, and one had a piece of her own gravestone with her name scrawled on it inside her body. Another one contained a hospital tag with the date and the cause of her death, and a dried human heart was found inside a third body. Moskvin later admitted that he would stuff their decaying corpses with rags and wrap their hands in nylon tights and draw faces on them. He would also insert buttons or fake eyes into the girls' eye sockets so that they could watch cartoons with him. He told police that he dug up graves of girls because he was lonely and wanted children of his own. After taking them home, he used a simple solution of salt and baking soda to preserve the corpses. He treated them as if they were his daughters by singing to them and celebrating their birthdays. Moskvin also said he was waiting for science to find a way to bring the girls back to life. He always denied any sexual attraction to the dolls. In all, authorities discovered 29 life-size dolls in his apartment. They ranged in age from three to 25 and one corpse had been kept for nearly nine years. Remarkably, his parents claimed to know nothing of the true origin of the dolls living in their home, believing it was just a hobby of their sons. Moskvin was charged with a dozen crimes, all of which dealt with the desecration of graves. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia and sentenced to time in a psychiatric hospital. Chillingly, 
Moskvin allegedly told authorities not to bother reburying the girls too deeply, as he will simply unbury them when he is released. Attempted murder turned meme. This next one is an ongoing saga of misguided heroism, in which a young woman who tries to brutally murder her boyfriend gains a cult following amongst the Japanese meme community. It all began on May 23rd, 2019, when 21-year-old Yuka Takaoka was arrested for brutally stabbing her boyfriend, 20-year-old Phoenix Luna. The gruesome photos that were released in the aftermath showed Yuka sitting in the lobby next to her horribly wounded lover, completely drenched in his blood, casually smoking and talking on her mobile phone to an unknown person. The photograph soon went viral, but instead of people being repulsed by the image, the online anime community in Japan sanctified Yuka as the manifestation of a real-life Yandere, a character from the world of anime. Such a character, typically female, turns to homicidal violence in the pursuit of love. Since the attack, dozens of Instagram accounts have sprung up in support of Yuka and her besotted supporters claim she is too beautiful to be an attempted murder suspect. A donation page was even set up to support Yuka that raised over $3,000. Yuka and Phoenix both worked in hostess clubs in the Kabukicho district in Shinjuku, Tokyo. Yuka was a manager of a so-called girls bar and Phoenix was a bar host at Fusion Nightclub. Hostess clubs are famous in the nightlife industry of East Asian countries where male and female hosts are paid to keep guests company and entertain them. Yuka and Luna had recently started dating, but Yuka had grown increasingly jealous of the female attention her boyfriend received as a host. And when he arrived at her home late on May 23rd, and the couple had an argument about a photo of a woman Phoenix had on his phone, the couple went to bed, but Yuka waited for her boyfriend to fall asleep before viciously slicing open his stomach with a kitchen knife. Phoenix woke up terrified and managed to escape to the first floor lobby of the apartment block and call emergency services, and that is when the horrific photo was taken. Phoenix was later rushed unconscious to hospital. After the sick image started circulating, and Yuka was arrested, media reports emerged, stating that Yuka told investigators, Since I loved him so much, I just couldn't help it. I was sad and seeking to die, and I thought about how I would like to go about it. I thought I would like to kill him, because I thought that was how I could be with him. I thought that expressions such as, I like you, and I would like to be with you, would become a reality if we both die. Fortunately, Phoenix survived the attack after initially only being given a 20% chance, and he popped up on Twitter on July 1st, 2019, tweeting, sorry guys, but I survived this one. Despite his trauma, Phoenix Luna showed no ill will towards Yuka and told reporters, I don't hold a grudge, there was a reason for her to stab me. It was also thanks to her that I was able to achieve the sales I did in less than a year since returning as a host. Yuka has been charged with the attempted murder of Phoenix Luna and is currently in custody awaiting her court date. Meanwhile, her crime and misplaced admiration lives on in the form of the many memes and artwork created of her crime. The Tragic Story of the Donner Party In the 1840s, the fertile farmlands of Central California drew a steady stream of settlers, and in the spring of 1846, several families from Springfield, Illinois, joined the Westwood Migration. On April 14, 1846, after an emotional farewell, wealthy brothers George and Jacob Donner, along with local businessman James Reed and their families, left Springfield to make the long journey to a new life in the Bay of San Francisco. The group consisted of George and Jacob's combined 12 children, as well as Reed's four children and their respective wives. In addition, around a dozen Teamsters and camp assistants joined them, making a total of 32. Everything the group needed to make the journey was packed, including peace offerings of jewelry and cloth, should they encounter any hostile native Indians along the route. Within a month, the Donners and Reeds had reached Independence, Missouri. They were all healthy and in good spirits, and looked forward to joining the main wagon train heading west. After a brief stop, the group set off again, and over the next six weeks, covered around 650 miles, 
reaching Fort Laramie, now southeastern Wyoming, in July 1846. At this point, the group divided. Most of the wagons went north towards Fort Hall, using the tried and trusted Oregon Trail. But the Reeds, the Donners, and a number of others decided to take a shortcut and headed southwest toward Fort Bridger. This route had been recommended to them by an unreliable guide named Lansford Hastings. He had claimed that this route would shave more than 300 miles from the journey to California. In reality, Hastings' shortcut was 125 miles longer than the established trail, and it would take the pioneers through some of the most inhospitable county in the entire Great Basin. James Reed had been warned not to take this route, but he didn't heed this advice, and the party of 87 people pressed on in a convoy of 23 ox-drawn wagons. George Donner was elected to serve as their leader. On July 31st, the Donner party entered Hastings Cutoff, which would take the group south of the Great Salt Lake in what is now Utah. During that first week, they made good progress. However, Hastings, who had promised to lead them along the trail, was now with a different company of wagons, and the inexperienced Reed had to act as a guide. By the time they reached the Great Salt Lake Desert on August 30th, they were already two weeks behind schedule but Hastings had assured them that they would be able to cross the desert in just two days. But instead, the journey took five days, and the party lost dozens of cattle in the desert, and several wagons had to be abandoned. By the time the Donner party reached the Humboldt River, where the shortcut rejoined the main California trail, it was late September. All the other migrants of 1846 had already completed their journeys to California, and for the Donner Party, it was now a race against time before the winter weather set in. The migrants were exhausted and tensions were running high. And on October 5th, an altercation between Reed and a teamster ended with Reed fatally stabbing the man. The horrified migrants called for Reed to be hanged, but instead they expelled him from the group, leaving him just with a horse. Reed continued his journey west alone, while the rest of his family remained with the Donner Party. As the party began their climb of the Sierra foothills, their food supply was running low, and several of their oxen were already dead or had wandered off. By this point, they had hidden or buried virtually all their possessions, except the barest essentials necessary for survival. On October 31st, the exhausted migrants approached what is now known as Donna Pass across the Sierra Nevada, and found their passage blocked by deepening snow. Most of the party decided to build makeshift shelters near what is now known as Donner Lake. The Donners and Reeds, whose progress was delayed by a wagon accident, made a similar camp a few miles further east, on the trail near Alder Creek. By now, all the migrants were in dire trouble. On November 20th, 1846, Patrick Breen, whose family had joined the party in Independence, Missouri, began a diary, which he continued to write until March 1st, 1847. His account would provide the only contemporary written record of the Donner Party's ordeal. On December 15, 1846, the first recorded death at the lake camp occurred, when Bayless Williams, an employee of the Reed family, died of malnutrition. His death was the first of many. In desperation, some of the migrants tried to branch off and walk to get help, but the conditions soon prevented this, and they returned to the camps even more malnourished than when they left. Things were so bad that the migrants were eating the ox hide that was providing their huts with warmth and shelter. Strips of the ox hide were boiled up to make a disgusting glue-like soup. Quarrels between the members were also rife, with some claiming rations that were being saved for the children. On December 16, 1846, a party of 17 men, women, and older children decided to try and cross the mountains on improvised snowshoes. Two of the party turned back early on, but the rest powered on. During the following torturous weeks, the group experienced snow blindness and overwhelming hardships caused by the bitter cold. However, the snowshoes proved to be effective on the climb, and despite the deep snow and inadequate food, they struggled on. But soon they became lost and confused, and that is when one of them first suggested that someone should volunteer to die to feed the others. Initially, this idea was rejected, but as they went on, and some of the party died anyway, in desperation, they were forced to eat the corpses to survive. Allegedly, towards the end, they were deciding amongst themselves who would be the next to be eaten, 
although it's unclear if any murders actually took place. Finally, the group stumbled into a Native American settlement where they were given food and shelter, and after a few days, with the help of tribe members, one of the party reached a ranch and a small farming community at the edge of the Sacramento Valley. A relief party was organized to rescue the stranded settlers at the lake camps. James Reed had also made it out to the Sierra Nevada and had already arranged an unsuccessful search party to try and rescue his family. Back at the camps, many migrants were dying of cold and hunger, and Jacob and George Donner were among them. After several rescue parties were sent out, some of the migrants made it back safely, but several deaths occurred on the way, and because of illness and injuries, it was impossible to remove everyone at the same time, and by the time the rescuers arrived, many of the late camp members had already turned to cannibalism in order to survive. The last of the survivors did not leave the lake camp until April 1847. Of the 87 migrants in the river camps, only 48 survived. All of the Reed and Breen family lived, but Jacob and George Donner and their wives all perished. Some of their children survived, but were left orphaned. In the aftermath of the tragedy, with rumors of cannibalism rife, many of the survivors disputed the accounts, although some did speak freely about what they had to do to survive. Eliza Donner, who was only three years old during migration, and was the youngest of the Donner children, later published an account of the ordeal, and wrote about the emotional scars caused by the rumours of cannibalism. Many years later, in 2010, the remains from the campsite were examined again, and researchers announced that they had been unable to find any human bones, or other physical evidence of cannibalism. Although it was noted that only cooked bones would be preserved, and it's unlikely that the Donner Party members would have needed to cook human bones. Today, the site of the makeshift cabins is a tourist attraction that receives thousands of visitors each year. The state of California justifies memorializing a site where cannibalism likely occurred, stating the episode was an isolated and tragic incident of American history that has been transformed into a major folk epic. Bella Elmore. Now this next one is a bit of a blast from the past, but it's a case we've never covered on top fives, so thought we would have a look, as there has been a recent twist in the story. Kunigunde Makamotsi was the daughter of a Russian-Polish father and German mother. She went by various aliases, including Bella Elmore and Cora Turner. Bella was her stage name, however the aspiring music hall artist had little or no talent, so rarely found work. In 1893, under the name of Cora Turner, she married a homeopath and medicine dispenser, Hawley Harvey Crippen in New Jersey City. Cora was Crippen's second wife. His first wife, Charlotte, had died of a stroke in 1892. And after her death, Crippen had moved to New York and left the care of his two-year-old son, Hawley Otto, to his parents in California. In 1897, Crippen and Cora moved to London, although his US medical qualifications were not sufficient to allow Crippen to practice as a doctor in the UK, so he found work as a distributor of patent medicines, while Cora continued to pursue her stage career. By all accounts, Cora was an overbearing woman who liked to socialize and had several affairs, but nevertheless, her husband tried to support her as much as he could, and eventually it cost him his job as he was spending so much time trying to manage her career. In 1900, Crippen found work again as the manager of Druett's Institution for the Deaf. By 1905, the Crippen's marriage was in trouble and they moved to 39 Hilldrop Crescent in Holloway, London, where they took in lodgers to supplement Crippen's meager income. Allegedly, Cora had an affair with one of these lodgers and in turn, Crippen started an affair with Ethel Lenouf a young typist who worked at Druitt's. For the next five years, the Crippens led separate lives and slept in separate beds. However, Cora still liked to throw dinner parties for her showbiz friends, and on the evening of Monday, the 31st of January, 1910, two close friends of Cora, Paul and Clara Martinetti, came around for a meal. The couple left at around 1 a.m. on Tuesday, the 1st of February, and all seemed well. That was the last time anyone saw Cora Crippen alive. 
Over the next few weeks, people began to ask where Cora was, and Crippen told a variety of stories about her whereabouts, but eventually said she had returned to America and died. Meanwhile, his lover moved into Hilldrop Crescent and began openly wearing Cora's clothes and jewelry. Cora's friends grew suspicious, and eventually one of them called the police, and on the 8th of July 1910, Chief Inspector Walter Drew knocked on the door of Hilldrop Crescent, where he found Ethel alone. Ethel told Drew he would find Crippen at work, so the inspector visited Crippen at his office, and the two returned together to Hilldrop Crescent where Crippen happily showed the officer around the house. He also told Drew a different story about Cora's whereabouts, saying she had left him for another man. Chief Inspector Dew seemed happy with this explanation and after a quick search of the house, left and asked Crippen to get his wife to contact him to confirm the story. However, Crippen and Ethel panicked and fled to Brussels where they spent the night at a hotel before boarding the Canadian Pacific liner, SS Montrose, at Antwerp bound for Canada. The pair's sudden departure prompted police to search the house in Hildrop Crescent again, and during the fourth and final search, they found the torso of a human body buried under the brick floor of the basement. An autopsy confirmed traces of the calming drug, scopolamine, in the body parts, and the remains were identified by a scar on a piece of skin from the abdomen that matched with the medical procedure Cora had had although her head, limbs, and skeleton were never recovered. Meanwhile, Crippen, who had shaved off his mustache and Ethel disguised as a boy, were crossing the Atlantic on Montrose, although passengers had noticed they looked overly affectionate for a father and son. A call had already been put out to ships about the two fugitives, and Captain Henry George Kendrell recognized the pair. Just before steaming beyond the range of his shipboard transmitter, he sent a wireless telegram to the British authorities. Crippen would be the first criminal to be captured with the aid of wireless telegraphy. On receiving the message, Inspector Dew boarded a faster White Star liner, SS Laurentic, from Liverpool, and arrived in Quebec, Canada, ahead of Crippen. Dew then boarded the Montrose disguised as a pilot, and Crippen was invited to meet the pilots as they came aboard. Dew removed his pilot's cap and said, Good morning, Dr. Crippen, do you know me? I'm Chief Inspector Dew from Scotland Yard. After a pause, Crippen replied, Thank God it's over. The suspense has been too great. I couldn't stand it any longer. He then held out his wrists for the handcuffs. Crippen and Ethel were returned to Britain, where they stood trial at the Old Bailey, although none of the evidence presented seemed conclusive. But despite this, the jury found Crippen guilty of murder after just 27 minutes, and he was sentenced to death. Ethel was charged only with being an accessory after the fact and acquitted. Throughout the proceedings and at his sentencing, Crippen showed no remorse for his wife, only concerned for his lover's reputation. On Wednesday, the 23rd of November, 1910, 48-year-old Crippen was hanged at Pentonville, London. His last request was for a photograph of Ethel and some of her letters to be buried with him in his unmarked grave, a request that was granted. Over the years, questions have arisen about the investigation, trial, and evidence that convicted Crippen. And in October 2007, Michigan State University forensic scientist David Foran claimed that mitochondrial DNA evidence showed the remains found beneath Crippen's cellar floor were not those of Cora Crippen, and that the flesh samples found at the scene were that of a male. However, the new scientific evidence for Crippen's innocence has been disputed because the technique used was very new and done only by one team on a degraded sample. In December 2009, the UK's Criminal Cases Review Commission, having reviewed the case, declared that the Courts of Appeal will not hear the case to pardon Crippen posthumously. Crippen's name has lived on, and between 1910 until 2016, a waxwork of Dr. Crippen was on display in the Chamber of Horrors at Madame Tussauds in London. But in a curious twist, during the Dogger Bank earthquake of 1931, the strongest earthquake ever recorded in the UK, the head of Crippen's waxwork fell off and rolled along the floor in what many believed was a message from the grave. There is no doubt the investigation into Kara's disappearance was less than perfect. So could they have hung an innocent man? What do you think?
the boy from Somos Sierra. This next case is well known in Spain, where it happened, but is less well known to the rest of the world. It's the mystery of what happened to the boy from Somos Sierra, a case dubbed Europe's strangest disappearance. Andreas Martinez was a truck driver who lived in the south of Spain, in Fuente Alamo, Murcia. On some of his trips, he took along his wife, Carmen Gomez, and their 10 year old son, Juan Pedro. On June 24th, 1986, Andreas was due to transport 20,000 litres of sulfuric acid up north to the Spanish city of Bilboa. Because Juan had done well in school, Andreas invited Juan and Carmen along for the journey. The family left around 7 pm after picking up the truck in the city of Cartagena. And by 6 a.m. the following day, the truck had entered Soma Sierra, a mountain pass to the north of Madrid. At this point, witnesses described the truck as being driven erratically and at speeds, as if it had a mechanical problem. Soon after, the truck broke off another driver's car wing mirror, and then it bumped into another car from behind, causing it to crash head on with the truck that was traveling in the opposite direction. The impact caused Andreas's truck to overturn, spilling the sulfuric acid out onto the side of the road and covering the area with a toxic cloud. The authorities had to act quickly to neutralize the acid before it leaked into a nearby river. After the area had been cleaned up, sadly they found Andreas and Carmen's body in the crashed truck. However, Juan was nowhere to be seen. Although initially they weren't looking for him, as it wasn't until they spoke to relatives that they realized the boy was traveling with his parents. Investigators later re-examined the truck and surrounding area, but found no signs of Juan Pedro. Thoughts turned to the possibility that the sulfuric acid had melted his body, although chemists later dismissed the idea, as he would have had at least left behind some hair, teeth or nails at the scene. Witnesses soon came forward and said the last time the family was seen was at a bar at around 5.30 a.m. on the morning of the crash, where there didn't appear to be anything untoward about their demeanor. After examining the truck, investigators discovered that there was nothing wrong with Andreas's truck, so there was no mechanical reason for him to be driving the way he was. However, his tachometer recorded that Andreas had stopped his truck 12 times as he went up the mountain during a period of 20 minutes, which does seem strange. To this day, nothing has been found of 10-year-old Juan, despite extensive investigations. So what happened to him? While there have been many theories, the most popular is that Juan was kidnapped and his father was pursuing his abductors when he crashed. This is kind of backed up by the driver of the car, who Andreas hit, who told police he was assisted by a man and blonde-haired woman in a white van. The woman was allegedly a nurse and looked over the man's injuries before driving away. The same couple were also allegedly seen pulling up to Andreas's truck after the collision and took something out of the cab, possibly a package or even Juan. This does seem a little far-fetched, but not beyond the realms of possibility. Others have suggested drugs were involved, although the family have strenuously denied this. Another theory speculates that Juan Pedro might have survived the crash and climbed out of the truck and while looking for help stumbled upon the white van couple who then abducted him or that he was burned by the acid and stumbled out of the cab, tried to make his way to the river to soothe his skin. Although considering the massive search for Juan Pedro after it was discovered that he was missing, it seems likely that he would have been found had he wandered around the area and collapsed or died somewhere. But Juan Pedro's family are hanging on to the belief that he is still alive. It's been reported that in May 1987, a man in Madrid met a blind old woman and a boy who looked like Juan Pedro. The woman was an Iranian refugee looking for the American embassy. She said that she and her family had been in Spain for only six months, yet the boy she was with spoke fluent Spanish with an Andalusian accent just like Juan. When the man complimented the boy's strong Spanish, the old woman got nervous and wouldn't explain how he knew the language so well. Today, Juan Pedro would be 45 years old, and if he is still alive, how amazing would it be if he made contact? The Pottery Cottage Murders When someone is convicted of a violent crime, we trust the system to keep that person safely incarcerated for the duration of their sentence until they are deemed fit to be released back into society. Sadly, in our next story, that was not the case, and the consequences were horrific. 
On the night of the 21st of August 1976, William Thomas Hughes followed a young couple he had met in a nightclub to a park where he beat the man with a brick and raped his partner. Hughes was quickly arrested after a tip-off from a member of the public and was remanded to Leicester Prison. However, despite a criminal past of violent behaviour, Hughes was allocated work in the prison kitchen and on the 3rd of December 1976, he stole a boning knife that he managed to conceal from prison authorities despite regular searches. It later transpired that limited information about how violent Hughes could be was not passed on to Leicester Prison, and because of his demeanour and good behaviour, they designated him as a low-risk Category B inmate. They didn't receive the full report of how dangerous he was until after he escaped. On the 12th of January 1977, Hughes was scheduled to appear at court in Chesterfield, and he was transported to the court in the back of a taxi, handcuffed to prison officer Ken Simmons, fellow officer Don Sprittle was sat in the front next to the driver. So instead of Hughes having both hands cuffed, he had one hand free. The weather conditions during the 55 mile journey were horrendous. There had been heavy snowfall and the traffic was disrupted. As they neared the end of their journey, Hughes insisted he needed to stop for a bathroom break. This was when he retrieved the stolen bony knife he had hidden on his person. And when he returned to the taxi, he stabbed Sprintle in the back of the neck before turning the knife on Simmons. After incapacitating both, he dumped the driver and the badly injured officers at the roadside. Hughes then drove the taxi off at speed, crashing into a wall along a road close to Beely Moor in the Derbyshire Peak District of Central and Northern England. Police were soon notified of Hughes' escape and an immediate search was ordered. However, initially they searched the wrong area, believing that Hughes wouldn't attempt to cross the exposed moorland in such bad weather, but they were wrong. Hughes had made his way across the moor and stopped at a remote farmhouse called Pottery Cottage. Hughes entered the home from the back door armed with two axes he had stolen from the garden shed. The only people home were Arthur and Amy Minton, who shared the cottage with their youngest daughter Gillian, her husband Richard Moran, and their adopted 10-year-old daughter Sarah. Hughes told Arthur and Amy that he was on the run from the police and needed to lay low until dusk. He promised them he wouldn't hurt them. Soon after, Gillian and Sarah arrived home, followed sometimes later by Richard, who found Hughes holding a knife to his wife's throat, threatening to kill her if anyone approached him. He forced Richard to the floor and bound his hands and legs. He then tied up Gillian and Amy, followed by Arthur and Sarah, who were in the annex. But Arthur strongly resisted and was brutally manhandled, dragged across the floor and tied to an armchair. Hughes then gagged all the adults and isolated them in separate rooms, taking Sarah through to the annex. Gillian, who was bound and gagged in her bedroom, heard the sounds of a commotion coming from the lounge below and realised it was her father being beaten. After the beating, Hughes casually made tea for his hostages and later sexually assaulted Gillian. The next morning, a local authority truck arrived to empty the septic tank. Hughes ordered Gillian outside to greet them, warning her to act normal. As she walked through the house, she caught a glimpse of her father, who appeared motionless in the armchair. Hughes dragged her away, telling her that he was asleep. Gillian also asked about her daughter's whereabouts, and Hughes assured her that she was asleep in the annex. After getting the family to call in sick to work and school, Hughes sent Gillian out alone to buy newspapers and cigarettes and check for roadblocks, warning her not to do anything stupid. Terrified of what he might do to her family, Gillian carried out his instructions. When Gillian returned, she noticed that her father had been moved. Hughes claimed that he was now in his bedroom, Throughout that day, Gillian made food for the family and Hughes took it to them. He even took some soft toys into Sarah, claiming that she was really pleased to see them. Hughes reassured his hostages that he would be leaving that evening and he untied Gillian, Richard and Amy and they all drank whiskey together and played card games. Hughes prepared for his escape by sending Gillian and Richard out for supplies. During the journey, Richard tried to convince his wife that they should go to the police, but fearing for the life of her daughter and parents, she refused. That night, the weather conditions were so treacherous that Hughes decided to stay for a second night. The next evening, Hughes parted Pottery Cottage, leaving all his hostages tied up, but he decided to take Gillian with him. However, after driving several miles, he insisted they turn around and go back to the house, claiming he had forgotten a map. Hughes went back into the house alone and was gone for a considerable time. And when he returned, the car wouldn't start so he sent Gillian unaccompanied to a neighbor's house to ask for a tow. 
There, she finally alerted them to the hostage situation, but they didn't have a phone, so they had to travel to get help. As Gillian walked back to the car, she could see her mother staggering in the snow before collapsing. Hughes then forced Gillian to approach another neighbor for help. This time he went with her, and soon they were on their way. By now, the first neighbor had alerted the police, and they had arrived at Pottery Cottage. There they found a scene of utter horror. Amy Minton lay dead in the snow, and inside the house, they found the bodies of Richard, Sarah, and Arthur. All four had multiple stab wounds to the throat and chest. Cruelly, Hughes had kept up the pretense that Arthur and Sarah were still alive throughout, even pretending to speak with them, when in reality, it was clear they had both been murdered on the first night. The police soon caught up with Hughes and Gillian, and a high-speed chase ensued across Derbyshire and into Cheshire, ending when Hughes crashed into a wall in the village of Reno. As police tried to negotiate, Hughes held an axe over Gillian's head and demanded a vehicle in which to escape. To try and save Gillian's life, a car was provided. But when Hughes went to strike Gillian with the axe, police marksmen opened fire and shot Hughes dead. It was the first time an officer from Derbyshire Constabulary had shot anyone dead, and the first time British police had shot dead an escaped prisoner. Gillian was the only survivor. The Mysterious Disappearance of Little Pauline Pickard In April 1922, two-year-old Pauline Pickard disappeared whilst playing outside her home in the village of Goas al Ludi, in the region of Brittany, in northwest France. Her frantic parents gathered the locals, who searched the family farm and surrounding area, for clues to Pauline's whereabouts. But despite around 150 people joining the search, they turned up nothing. Pauline's family feared she had wandered off, and either died of cold or was eaten by a wild animal. Although it was strange, no trace of such an attack or the little girl's body was found. Rumours started to spread through the village that Pauline had been abducted by a chimney sweep who had recently visited the area. Others speculated she had been stolen by passing travellers or by two strangers that had been spotted loitering around the Pickards farm at the time of Pauline's disappearance. However, despite extensive inquiries and searches by the police and volunteers, no trace could be found. Then about a month later, the police arrived at the Pickards farm carrying a photograph of a little girl who had been found wandering alone in the city of Cherbourg, over 200 miles away. A few days before the girl was found, she was seen with a scruffy woman who had tried to leave the child in a store before being chased down by the owner who gave the child back. Pauline's parents looked at the photo and were relieved to see it was their little girl, and her mother burst into tears, saying that's my daughter. Not long after, they boarded a train to Cherbourg, excited to be reunited with Pauline and bring her home. However, when they first saw her, they were not convinced it was their daughter. The girl didn't recognize them, and their unusually chatty daughter didn't say a word. When they spoke to her in their Breton language, she appeared not to understand. The parents spent a few days with the girl, and were soon convinced she was in fact Pauline. When asked by reporters if they were sure, the father replied, of course, she has the same hair and the same blue eyes. The girl was allowed to leave with the Pickards, and doctors hoped that once she was home, her normal surroundings would spark her memory and get her talking. On the way home, the girl spoke three words in Breton, further convincing the parents that the girl was Pauline. But when they returned to the farm, Pauline's siblings did not recognize the girl as their sister, and the family as a whole started to have their doubts about the girl's identity. Just a couple of weeks later, at the end of May 1922, a farmer was crossing a field about a mile from the Pickards' farm, when he discovered the horribly mutilated and decomposing torso of a small girl. Close to the corpse was a carefully folded pile of clothes that matched the description of the clothes Pauline was wearing when she disappeared. After the police arrived, they also found a severed head, although despite it being devoured by foxes, it didn't seem to match the size and features of a little girl. What was even more perplexing was that the area that the remains were found in had been searched multiple times after Pauline vanished. An examination revealed that the torso was Pauline's, and it was concluded she had died accidentally after getting lost and finding herself stranded in a storm that passed through the night, with the gruesome injuries put down to wild animals. Although strangely, her torso and stomach were intact, which were the parts of the body often eaten first by scavengers. 
No cause of death was determined, or an explanation for the folded clothes. In another extraordinary twist, it was revealed that the severed head belonged to an adult male who they were unable to identify. Locals found it hard to believe the reports, as they knew the area where the body was found had been searched several times. People started to speculate that the body wasn't Pauline, and that someone had planted a torso that resembled her. Of course, the big question was, who was the girl from Cherbourg? Well, sadly, no one ever found out. Not long after Pauline's torso was found, the Picard sent the girl back to Cherbourg to be adopted. The woman, who it was claimed had been trying to abandon her, was traced, although she still had her daughter with her. Suspicion soon fell on a man called Caramon, an umbrella salesman who had worked at the Picard's farm, but the case against him was dismissed due to lack of evidence. The other suspect was a local farmer called Eves Martin, who visited the Pickards when they arrived home with the girl, from Cherbourg, and said, Are you sure it's Pauline? God forgive me, I am guilty. Then he ran from the farm laughing hysterically, and the following day was taken to a lunatic asylum. Of course, there is another terrifying thought. After all, identified bodies in the 1920s was not an exact science, and it's therefore possible that the dead girl was not Pauline, but the girl from Cherbourg was, and her parents inadvertently sent their own child to be adopted. The Sarah Joe Mystery On the 11th of February 1979, Scott Mormon, Benjamin Calamer, Peter Hanchett, Patrick Wozner, and Ralph Malaiakini boarded a boat in the town of Hanna on the Hawaiian island of Maui for a day's fishing. The boat named the Sarah Joe was a 17 feet Boston whaler with an 85 horsepower engine. It was a basic vessel, only equipped for local fishing in calm waters. The men were all friends, had over 50 years of seagoing experience, and Ralph fished for a living. As they set off at around 10 a.m., it was a clear day and the water was calm. However, just two hours later, the weather worsened and a major storm approached the islands. Conditions out at sea would have been horrendous, with waves up to 40 feet high, and the Sarah Joe was ill-equipped for such a storm. A number of larger fishing boats managed to stagger back to port, but there was no sign of the Sarah Joe or her crew. When the men failed to return, an extensive search was mounted, and experts even brought in homing pigeons, especially trained to locate people stranded at sea. But after days of searching, it was concluded the Sarah Joe and all on board had wrecked and sank. However, family and friends weren't so quick to abandon their hopes of a rescue and pooled their cash and resources, managing to continue the search for an extra three weeks. Although sadly, still nothing was found and they had to accept the men were not coming back. A memorial service for the crew was arranged, which went on to become an annual event. However, over a decade later, some of the original search party members were on a routine wildlife mission around the uninhabited Marshall Islands for the National Marine Fisheries Service. The islands are approximately 2,200 miles southwest from where the Sarah Joe disappeared. On the 10th of September 1988, biologist John Norton came across an abandoned fiberglass boat on the coastlines of the islands. He could only see part of the registration of the boat, but it was enough to convince him that it came from somewhere in the Hawaiian Islands. On further inspection, it was confirmed the vessel was the Sarah Joe. A thorough search of inside the boat threw up nothing, so Norton and his team decided to search the surrounding area. That is when they discovered what looked like a grave that had a makeshift cross made out of driftwood. Also sticking out of the shallow grave was a human jawbone. A closer look at the grave revealed some blank pieces of paper about three inches square, resting on top of a human skeleton. All of the paper was loosely stacked like an unbound book. In between each sheet of paper was a thin silver, or silver-like metal. It was similar to a Chinese burial tradition, where small pieces of paper or paper money separated by gold or silver foil are placed in the coffin as a means of fortune for the afterlife. The team decided they had disrupted the grave enough and felt it was disrespectful to dig any more. However, they took the jawbone back for testing. Results revealed it belonged to Scott Mormon, one of the members on board the Sarah Joe. Another search of the island, where the grave was found, failed to yield any clues to the fate of the other four men. It also posed the question, if there were no other survivors, who buried Scott? 
It does seem likely that Mormon and the boat drifted to the area, but was he the only survivor? Although how a boat as basic as the Sarah Joe could survive one of the worst storms on record and end up on a desolate atoll, thousands of miles away is a mystery in itself. Experts have estimated that the drift time between Hawaii and the Marshall Islands would have been somewhere in the region of three months. Another conundrum is that four years before Norton and his team visited the island, another research team landed there and reported nothing out of the ordinary, even though a grave and a discarded boat would have been hard to miss. So the enduring question is, where was the boat between leaving Hawaii on the 11th of February 1979 and 1984 when the first research team visited the area? To date, no one has a clue, and the mystery rumbles on. Septic Tank Sam On April 13, 1977, the McLeod family returned to their former homestead in the small town of Tofield, Alberta, Canada, to look for a septic tank pump that they had left behind when they moved out of the now abandoned farm. As they opened the septic tank to look for the pump, they immediately realized something was wrong. Floating on top of the rancid water was a gray sock, but to their horror, they noticed it was still attached to a human leg. They called the police immediately, who slowly drained the tank of its putrid contents using buckets and a body was discovered. Although at this point, it was so decomposed, they couldn't determine if it was male or female. They also discovered that after being dumped in the tank, quick lime had been scattered over the corpse to quicken the decomposition process. Although in reality, the combination of quick lime and water caused the corpse to dry out and preserve itself longer than if it had just been left to decompose on its own. What was apparent was the body didn't get into the tank by accident, and they were looking at a deliberate act by someone. No other clues could be found around the homestead, but it was theorized the culprit was someone who knew the area as it was in such a secluded location. Once the corpse was brought back to the morgue and an autopsy was carried out, it was confirmed the body was a male aged between 26 and 40, with dark brown hair, medium build, and approximately 5 foot 5 to 5 foot 7 and likely of Native American descent, and he had been in the tank for up to 12 months. It was also revealed that he almost certainly suffered a serious illness as a child, although the illness had never been made public. The body was dressed in a blue Levi work shirt, a gray t-shirt, blue jeans, gray wool socks, and brown wallaby shoes. Early on in the investigation, the corpse earned the name Septic Tank Sam. Sam had suffered a horrific death, and was tortured before being dumped in the tank head first with his hands tied behind his back. It's believed he was burned with both cigarette butts and a blowtorch and had been severely beaten and sexually mutilated. The only saving grace for poor Sam was he was shot in the head and in the chest before being put in the tank and wrapped in a yellow bedsheet fastened with a length of cord. The police had very little to work on and despite releasing a composite sketch and dental records, no one came forward to identify the man. Eventually the body was buried in Edmonton with no name. Later the body was exhumed and DNA samples were taken as well as detailed measurements of the man's head before he was reburied. From the measurements, the world-renowned Dr. Clyde Snow recreated a skull and a facial reconstruction was made. However, despite repeated appeals, no one came forward to identify Sam. The only thing anyone really knows about him is that he met a violent end and was horrifically dumped in a putrid grave, and his true identity and reasons for his death may never be known. Isidore Fink The murder of New York laundryman Isidore Fink ranks as one of the most infamous unsolved crimes of all time. Isidore Fink was one of the many immigrants from Poland that came to America at the beginning of the 20th century in search of better life. His dreams, just like many others, were never fulfilled, but one thing did put him in the history book was the way he died. Isidore was a Polish Jew who settled in New York City where he opened a laundry business he called Fifth Avenue Laundry, and he lived in rooms next door. At 10.30 p.m. on March 9th, 1929, Isidore's neighbor saw him returning home from delivering laundry to his clients and closed his front door. About 15 minutes later, the same neighbor heard sounds of a struggle and fearing something awful had happened, she summoned a police officer who was on patrol in the area and they went to check Isidore was okay. 
However, they were unable to enter his property as all the doors and windows were locked from the inside, apart from a tiny transom window above the front door, which hung with its hinge broken. A child small enough to climb through the tiny window was used to get into the home and open the door from the inside. When officers entered the home, they found Isidore Fink's corpse, shot once in his left hand and twice in his chest. The key to the door was in the inside lock. There was no sign of robbery and his business cash remained untouched. A thorough search of his home revealed no murder weapon or spent cartridges and no sign of a struggle. Also, the room looked neat and tidy and undisturbed. Isidore was known to be fearful of being robbed and was meticulous about keeping his doors and windows locked at all times, and he never allowed strangers to enter either his home or his business. He had no known enemies and no known girlfriend or wife, and police could find no evidence that he was being extorted by local gangsters. What officers were faced with was an apparent motiveless crime committed in a seemingly impossible manner. There was no gun at the scene, which ruled out suicide. The gunshot wound on his hand showed powder burns, indicating he'd been shot at close range. But the door and windows apart from the tiny transom window were all still locked. The only fingerprints at the crime scene were his. So how did he die? Well, that is the unsolvable question. It was impossible for police to find a motive, impossible to find a murder weapon, and seemingly impossible for anyone but a small child to get in or out of the home. To many, the murder of Isidore Fink was the perfect crime that baffled detectives then, and still does to this day. The Lake Bodman Murders On June 4th, 1960, 15-year-old Mela and Anja and their 18-year-old boyfriends, Seppo and Nils, set out for a camping trip on the shores of the beautiful Lake Bodman, near the Finnish city of Espo. At around 6 a.m. the next morning, a group of boys who were birdwatching near the campsite noticed a flattened tent and a blonde-haired man walking hurriedly away. At the time, they thought nothing of it, until later, at around 11 a.m., a jogger by the name of Risto stumbled upon a horrific scene and alerted the police. Anja and Seppo's bodies were found in the flattened tent. They had been frantically bludgeoned and stabbed through the tent fabric. Mela was found on top of the tent, naked from the waist down and with significant stab wounds. All three of them were dead. Mela's boyfriend Nils was also found outside of the tent. He had also sustained several injuries, including a concussion, a fractured jaw and a deep knife wound to his forehead, but he was still alive when the police arrived on the scene. After police questioned Nils, he claimed to have no memory of the attack, although under hypnosis, he gave a description of a blonde man and a composite sketch was released. Whoever killed the three friends stole several personal items from them, including their wallets and multiple articles of clothing. Although Nils' shoes and some of the clothing were found about half a mile from the crime scene. All of the other items missing, including the murder weapon, have never been found. At the funeral of one of the victims, a man appeared in one of the photographs taken in the day that bore a striking resemblance to Nils' photo fit. However, the man has never come forward or been identified. What do you think? Over the years that followed, police followed up many lines of inquiry and questioned many suspects, but three in particular still raised suspicion in the community. Local man, Carl Gilstrom, who ran a nearby kiosk, was top of the list. He hated campers and children and supposedly confessed to the murders during a drunken conversation with a friend. However, his wife gave him a firm alibi and the police didn't believe he was the culprit. Carl had also been seen filling a well in his front yard only days after the murders, possibly hiding the murder weapon and stolen items, although police searches recovered nothing. However, when he drowned himself in Lake Bodden in 1969, locals were convinced he was the murderer, and when his wife recanted his alibi on her deathbed, many are convinced he was the culprit. Another suspect was Hans Asman, an alleged KGB spy and former Nazi, he became a suspect after turning up at Helsinki Surgical Hospital the day after the murders, with fingernails black with dirt and his clothes covered in red stains. Hospital staff said that he was acting very nervous and aggressive and had even feigned unconsciousness. But other than brief questioning, the police did not pursue Asman any further, claiming that he too had a solid alibi. However, later, Asman raised some other red flags in regards to the case, 
when after seeing a news report about the murders, in which they released the young boy's description of the man they saw leaving the crime scene, Asman cut off his long blonde hair. For many years, Asman remained a suspect, and was even suspected of involvement in other unsolved murders. Then in 2004, the case was reopened after 44 years, and advances in DNA technology ruled Asman out, and put another suspect in the frame. That person was lone survivor, Nils Gunderson. According to the prosecution, a drunken Gunderson killed his girlfriend in a fit of jealous rage, and got into a fight with Seppo, and that is how he got his facial injuries. He then killed Seppo and Anja in an attempt to dispose of witnesses, and inflict his other injuries on himself. Despite a strong defence, Nils was convicted, but only served one year of his life sentence after a successful appeal granted him his freedom. With Nils cleared, and most other suspects dead, it seems as though the children of Bodman will never have their killer brought to justice. Today, it is settled into local legend, and will have been told around many campfires to those visiting the area where it happened. The story is also featured in several internet articles, horror films, and of course, a Top 5's video. Eta Super This is another that is rooted more in folklore, but there are some kernels of truth to it. Across Scandinavia, particularly in Iceland, Sweden, and Norway, there are many natural precipices that jut out from the rocky landscape, which face directly onto the land below, which can often be just as jagged and rocky as the cliff face next to it. In prehistoric times, when the tales of rituals and old gods were whispered across the land, these cliffs, known as Atta Stupa, were according to sources from the time, the sites of some of the most upsetting and gruesome scenes history has shown us yet. Procopius of Caesarea, a Greek scholar first documented the practice when writing about the Heruli, an early Germanic tribe who originated in Scandinavia, and there are many references to it throughout the religion's folklore. When elderly members of the tribe reached a certain age, they would be ritually taken up to the side of the cliff. When they reached the top, they would jump, shattering their bodies on the rocks and earth below. This practice may have had roots in social or religious areas, and has lived on in the folklore of these countries for generations. Hotel Dal Santo Once a popular tourist attraction in Bogota, Colombia, the Hotel Dal Santo has a dark and creepy backstory. Built in 1923 with beautiful French architecture, the hotel was initially a mansion for Carlos Arturio Tapias, an architect himself. If the building itself wasn't amazing enough to look at, it overlooks the majestic Tequindama Falls, and is built on a huge cliff overlooking the surrounding rainforest. In the early 1990s, however, the hotel was shut down due to an issue with contaminated river water, and has been abandoned since. The hotel's creepy history is rooted in native Colombian folklore. The hotel is allegedly built on a popular suicide hotspot, specifically for the native Muisca people, who would often jump from to Queen Dama Falls to escape being captured and tortured by the invading Spanish in their initial South American conquests, which saw them overthrow the Aztecs and Incas. As a result, several strange occurrences have been reported to those visiting the hotel's grounds, including figures that have been spotted wandering the halls and grounds, and voices whispering in what people claim to be the language of the Muisca people. Loud piercing cries have been heard from inside the rooms of the hotel, and at one point, a woman was allegedly murdered there by a guest, disturbed by the things that he had witnessed in the hotel. People have claimed to have seen a woman matching her description, wandering the grounds as well. The Deadly Phone Number In 2010, Mobitel, a mobile phone company in Bulgaria, suspended the phone number 0888-888-888 from customer use, due to several strange happenings surrounding mobile users who previously owned it. Vladimir Groshnov was the first to own a phone with this number, who passed away from cancer in 2001, not long after using the number. Following this, the number was passed on to a member of the Bulgarian Mafia, 
In 2003, shortly after switching to the number, he was killed by an assassin while eating at a restaurant in the Netherlands. The next person to own the number was a corrupt estate agent who had been privately selling huge amounts of cocaine in a secret trafficking organisation he had set up. He was also assassinated outside an Indian restaurant in 2005. Mobitel have now allegedly stopped using this number permanently, and when the number is called, the caller hears a message stating that the number is outside of network coverage. It's most likely a strange coincidence, but a creepy one nonetheless. Rainbow Valley For those who succeed climbing Mount Everest is an amazing achievement, and one that they can look back on for the rest of their lives. A little over 5,000 people have managed to reach the summit and safely get back down again, but for others, it's not that simple. Rainbow Valley is an area of Mount Everest located at 80,000 meters in altitude on the peak's northern ridge. Climbers who pass this section of the mountain will be met with the grisly sight of numerous dead climbers who have been unsuccessful in scaling this part of the mountain, giving the area its name from their brightly colored jackets, oxygen supplies and climbing equipment. It is the point on the mountain where the most climbers have perished, and due to the location and nature of the region where they died, some of the bodies are impossible to reach or remove, and are left where they fell. These climbers are likely to have been killed by running out of oxygen, falling, or harsh weather. A grisly sight for anyone trying to reach the summit of Mount Everest. The Dancing Disease of 1518 Another historical horror story from what is now modern-day France in 1518, a very peculiar plague struck the city of Strasbourg, which at that time was part of the Holy Roman Empire. It started when one woman, named Mrs. Trophia, began uncontrollably dancing in the streets in the July of 1518. She perished, only stopping when exhaustion took over, and she collapsed from sheer tiredness, continuing even when she injured herself. In the first week of this bizarre occurrence, 30 more people joined her, exhibiting the same symptoms. For some strange reason, the civic and church leaders of Strasbourg decided it would be a good idea to encourage the dancing in order to stop it. As such, they arranged for dancing halls to be set up in the town centre, with musicians and professional dancers joining the affected from out of town. This only made things worse, and by the mysterious abrupt end of the plague in the September of that same year, 400 people had been affected, some of which passed away from their injuries. Although explanations from the time listed demonic possession as the most likely cause, it is now thought that the fungal infection known as ergot, passed on from eating contaminated bread, caused the outbreak. It surely was a strange moment in history. The Knock The idea of being in a space is likely mind-boggling to anyone who hasn't been there, but it seems there are moments in space that even the trained astronauts find tricky to comprehend. Yang Lui was China's first man in space, who first went up there in 2003, alone in a spacecraft all to himself. As he was up there, at work inside the craft, he heard what he described as somebody knocking on the side of the craft. Looking out of the porthole closest to where he heard the knock, he could not see anything that may have caused it. It's certainly a terrifying thought, but the explanation may be rooted in familiar science. Theories have ranged from part of the craft contracting or expanding, to some form of space debris hitting the side of the craft. It's highly unlikely that some otherworldly being was responsible for the knocking, but it definitely piques the imagination, and I'm sure it was pretty creepy for Yang. The Champwat Tiger we spoke about the Beast of Javordan earlier in this video, but here is a story of an animal much more familiar. The Champwat Tiger was a single female Bengal tiger, who towards the end of the 19th century in Nepal and India, was responsible for an estimated 436 human deaths. Every one of the tiger's victims were killed in broad daylight, and she managed to evade the hunters that were first sent out to kill her. When the hunters failed, soldiers organized a huge patrol to send the tiger away from the area, which proved successful. But then the deaths continued in other areas. The tiger proved to be exceptionally intelligent. 
she would adapt her hunting style to specifically hunt human beings, covering huge stretches of land during the night and attacking in the day. It wasn't until 1907 until a tiger was finally killed by Jim Corbett, a British hunter. He stalked the tiger for two days, almost becoming prey himself, before the tiger was finally shot, something which took two guns to do so. Major Henry Rathbone. It's possible that you haven't heard of Henry Rathbone before, but he was an indirect second victim of one of the biggest tragedies in US history, the Lincoln assassination. Henry was a US Army Major, and the night Lincoln was shot in the Ford Theater, he was accompanying him with his partner, Clara Harris. It was Henry who attempted to apprehend John Wilkes Booth after he fired, and was stabbed in the arm as a result after suffering several wounds. Henry and Clara soon married and had three children, but Henry was an unfortunate victim of severe survivor's guilt and could never get over that night in the theater with Lincoln and Booth. Henry couldn't forgive himself for not being able to stop the assassination and descended deep into mental illness as a result, suffering torturous hallucinations. The family eventually moved to Germany and on the Christmas Eve of 1883, a delirious Henry became violent with his family before hurting himself in the process. He shot Clara, killing her, and stabbed himself several times with a sharp knife, eerily recreating that fateful night. Henry was sent to an asylum where he spent the remainder of his life, passing away in 1911. He was subsequently buried in Germany, his body next to Clara's. The Lady of the Dunes in the July of 1974, a 12-year-old girl and her dog stumbled across the remains of a woman, estimated to have died two weeks prior, in the Race Point Dunes of Provincetown, Massachusetts. The body showed no signs of a struggle, and she was lying on her back, a pair of jeans under her head, indicating that she may have been asleep when she died. The head was almost removed from the body, and she had suffered a deep head wound, caused by a shovel-like entrenching tool. The victim was missing several teeth, both hands and one forearm. Police initially searched through thousands of missing person cases for the woman, but there was no match, and over the years, many facial reconstructions have been developed to try and identify her. To this day, it is unknown who she actually is. We do know, however, who committed the crime. Hayden Clark admitted to the atrocity, but has refused to tell the police anything about who the deceased woman was, on the account of him being poorly treated in the investigation. Jen Sakain and Hiroko Kazama. This is a terrifying story from Japan about two dog breeders turned murderers. Jen Sakain and Hiroko Kazama from the town of Chichibu were highly reputable in their trade, but were also known to be shady with their business laced with crimes such as stealing, fraud, and associations with the Yakuza. Things took an even darker turn after one particular sale. Sakain was evidently adept at swindling money, but was bad with spending it, which resulted in tricky financial times for the couple in the early 90s. Two breeding dogs were sold to the company director of an industrial waste disposal company by Sakain in 1993 for 11 million yen. This sale was a scam. The female dog was too old to breed and was worth 100 times less than the selling price. When the customer demanded a refund, Sakain and his wife came to the conclusion that due to their poor financial situation, they were unable to pay it back. So what did they do? They killed him. He was in fact the first of four victims of these heinous crimes, where a similar series of events would take place. The victims mysteriously disappeared, killed by the couple, before being transported to the nearby mountains to be finally chopped up into unrecognizable pieces. What couldn't be chopped was burned in an oil drum. The couple were in 1995, eventually brought to justice, when the disappearances were linked and investigated by the police. The evidence pointed to Sakain and Kazama, who were both sentenced to death. Sixteen years after the sentence was passed out, Sakain died from illness, but Kazama remains on death row to this date. Zana. This is another tragic story which this time takes place in 19th century Abkhazia, 
on the border between Russia and Georgia. One cold evening in the misty woodlands of the region, hunters had captured an individual who, from sources at the time, was described as being half woman, half animal. The individual was brought to the estate of the local nobleman, Edig Janaba, who named the wild woman Zana. Zana lived with Janaba until her death, and over time grew accustomed to life on his estate. As she warmed to her captors, she was treated more and more like a person and less like an animal, allowed to walk freely amongst the people of the estate. Zana was unlike anything these people had seen before, however. She never once spoke, preferring to communicate in a series of grunts, howls, and shouts. She refused all clothing that was offered to her, and her two-meter-tall body was covered in a thick layer of hair, leading many to brand Zana as a yeti or similar cryptid. She also allegedly possessed extreme strength and great athleticism. She was supposedly able to lift a 50 kilogram sack above her head with ease and outrun a racehorse. When Zana died, she was buried in Janaba's family cemetery, the location of which is not known. Zana did, however, give birth to at least two sons and two daughters from different fathers on Janaba's estate throughout her life. One of these sons, a man named Quit, had his grave identified and studied in 1971, and in 2013, his remains were sent off to Professor Brian Sykes at the University of Oxford. Sykes, an expert of genetics, was able to reveal Zana's tragic backstory. Zana's ancestry, based on Sykes' studies, proved to be 100% of sub-Saharan African origins. A possible explanation for the story is that Zana was captured as a slave in Africa, managed to escape in the Abkhazia region, and spent a long time wandering the wilds and sustaining herself in the wilderness before Janaba's men captured her. This is surely one of history's strangest and saddest tales. The Eruption of Lake Nyos Lake Nyos, located in northwestern Cameroon, is a large, deep crater lake which sits on the side of an inactive volcano. Underneath the lake lies a big pool of magma which causes carbon dioxide to seep into the lake water, converting it into carbonic acid. Tragedy struck in 1986 when the lake erupted, launching over one cubic kilometer of gas into the surrounding air. Firstly, the lake's water level dropped by about a meter after the gas was released, and trees from the surrounding forests were knocked down. A hundred meter tall column of water and foam built up, causing a 25 meter wave that crashed against the lake shore. The invisible cloud of gas traveled between 20 and 50 kilometers per hour down the valley and into the surrounding villages, where the carbon dioxide suffocated any living being it came into contact with. This resulted in the tragic deaths of 1,746 people and around 3,500 livestock. A further 4,000 people managed to escape the gas, but many of them suffered dangerous respiratory conditions in the aftermath of the silent, deadly disaster. The truth behind Frankenstein. Most people are familiar with the story of Frankenstein, written by Mary Shelley in 1818. The tale of a scientist who brings a human-like creature to life from the remains of the dead. Shelley is renowned for writing one of the most famous works of fiction in human history, but just how much of it is really fiction? It turns out that Shelley might have been inspired by her own work a little too much. Shelley owned a pet dog, Richard, a dog that she performed grisly experiments on, similar to the ones performed by Dr. Frankenstein in the book. Writing in the Journal of Transplantation in 1821, Shelley describes in her own words what she did. Using a general anaesthetic to knock Richard out, she surgically removed all four of his legs, replacing the front ones with those of a cat and the hind ones with those from a young Shetland pony. She then passed shockwaves through the limbs, which she spent hours attaching, and waited for Richard to wake up. He was alive, surprisingly. He also had problems walking, unsurprisingly. Richard spent the following months in a shack at the back of her house, where she would only take him out at night. He eventually escaped, allegedly running away to a house inhabited by a human man, who had been the victim of similar experiments involving a dog, a prawn and an octopus. But you can believe as much of that as you want. The 
the Plague Riots. When the plague struck Moscow in the 1770s, all hell broke loose. The terrified citizens, furious that the authorities had imposed forced quarantines before destroying their contaminated properties, caused a great deal of unrest amongst the Russian people. The first riots took place when a huge mob of the infected broke into the Kremlin, destroying the Chodov Monastery, home of the Archbishop. The Archbishop managed to flee to a neighbouring monastery, Donskoy, but citizens soon managed to capture that one too, killing the bishop in the process. Several of the quarantine zones keeping the infected in were destroyed, and the mob marched once again to the Kremlin in the following days, where the Russian military was waiting for them. The military opened fire on the rebels after they issued their demands of surrendering the lieutenant overseeing the quarantine process, and the mob was dispersed. Once the rebellion was put down, 165 adults were brought to trial, and the authorities executed the four individuals who had started the riots, as well as, strangely, the church bell that the rebels used to start their alarm. The bell was partially dismantled and left silent in the church tower for over three decades. It now resides in the Kremlin's Armory Museum. They're on the moon watching us. Finishing off with another creepy space story, this one surrounds the first American moon landing and astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, the first and second men on the moon. The initial moon landing had been the subject of many strange conspiracy theories in its time, many of which we've covered on Destination Declassified, but this one might be the strangest. Allegedly, in a confidential message to NASA he recorded following the landing, Neil Armstrong is supposed to have spoken these strange words. These babies were huge, sir, enormous. Oh God, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecrafts out here, lined up on the far side of the crater's edge. They're on the moon watching us. Now, believe as much of that as you will, but it's certainly an unsettling message if it's true. Buzz Aldrin also claimed to have seen a light moving alongside the craft whilst on this mission. What do you think took place up there? The Grizzly Botched Execution of Mary Queen of Scots The daughter of James V of Scotland and the French Mary of Guise, an 18-year-old Mary, Queen of Scots, ephemerally found herself the Queen of both France and Scotland when her husband Francis II became king in 1559. She was deported back to Scotland merely a year later when Francis passed away from an ear infection. Meanwhile in England, Elizabeth I had ascended to the throne and Mary was eager to secure her place on that throne when Elizabeth passed. As such, she married her English cousin, Lord Darnley, to strengthen her connections in England. Darnley, however, perished in a mysterious explosion, and as Mary had recently managed to anger the English nobility by subsequently marrying the Earl of Bathwell, they were both imprisoned at Loch Leven. Mary, now desperate, decided to abdicate to England Elizabeth initially welcomed her to the country, but was eventually put under house arrest, as Mary's name was floating around several plots to take Elizabeth's throne. Eventually, 19 years later, the plot escalated with a report of a major murder conspiracy against Elizabeth, involving Mary, and she was sentenced to death by beheading. Mary's execution, which occurred on the 8th of February, 1589, was one of the world would not forget. Robert Wingfield, a reliable eyewitness account, describes the events as follows. Once Mary had said her farewells and final words, a piece of cloth was tied around her eyes by one of her ladies-in-waiting. Mary then kneeled before the executioner's block, uttering prayers in Latin. As she was held down, the executioner raised his axe, brought it down upon Mary's neck, and missed. Misjudging his swing, the executioner had struck in such a location that Mary's head was not severed and she was still very much alive. According to Winkfield, she made very small noise or none at all, and not stirring any part of her from the place where she lay. Two chops later and Mary's head was still not off. The executioner had severely botched the ordeal. When he finally cut through the one last gristle that was left, he raised the head before the horrified crowd proclaiming God save the Queen. 
Apparently, Mary's lips continued to move for 15 minutes after the beheading, and as Mary's clothes were removed, her little pet dog, likely a Scottish terrier, had been found to have been hiding in her dress throughout the execution. The dog would not leave Mary's side, promptly laying down in the pool of blood between Mary's head and neck after it was discovered. The House of 200 Demons Now this is one that is still surrounded in mystery, and some of the events that occur in it are indeed impossible, but there must be some kernels of truth in there, obscured by the seemingly fictitious elements. In the November of 2011, Leota Ammons, her mother Rosa Campbell, and her three children moved into a new house located at 3860 Carolina Street in Gary, Indiana. This would trigger a bizarre chain of events that led to one of the most bizarre cases in all of history. One month after the family moved into the new house, they claimed to have seen huge clouds of black flies circling the front porch, which persisted even after they were exterminated. After Rosa claimed to hear footsteps and see shadow-like figures in the house, she was mysteriously choked by a strange, unseen force. From there, things only seemed to worsen. Ammons was awoken at two in the morning by a disturbance in her 12-year-old daughter's bedroom. When she entered the room, the girl was allegedly levitating above her bed, unconscious. Reaching out to clairvoyants and members of the church, the family were told that their house was possessed by as many as 200 demons, and an exorcism was arranged soon after. After the exorcism, the house returned to normal for three days, but then things worsened once more. The children's eyes allegedly bulged from their sockets, and they began talking in deep, demonic voices. Other incidents were subsequently described, including scenes where Ammon's seven-year-old son attempted to attack and kill his brother, and his eyes rolled back in his head while he uttered a deep, demonic growl. When the exorcisms didn't work, the family moved away from Gary to a new house in Indianapolis, where the incidents suddenly stopped. It is a bizarre case, without a doubt, and as such, it has drawn a lot of attention from skeptics. But what do you think? Was it all an elaborate hoax, or are parts of this really true? The Shark Arm Case Although attacks on humans are rare, the tiger shark is considered one of the most dangerous species to us, and one was caught up in a horrifying series of events in Australia in the April of 1935. Caught off a beach suburb near the Australian town of Kugi, and subsequently moved to Kugi Aquarium, the tiger shark became ill, and in front of a crowd of onlookers, vomited up a human hand and arm, on which was a distinctive tattoo. From the tattoo and the fingerprints, police were able to deduce that the remains belonged to Jim Smith, a local boxer and petty criminal. These investigations also revealed something much more disturbing, that the arm had not been bitten off by the shark, but was rather severed by a knife. Two main suspects were put forward. Reginald Holmes, a smuggler, and Patrick Brady, a convicted forger. What transpired was as follows. Smith, who had been blackmailing Holmes, had gone missing after a game of cards with Brady. The police searched the surrounding areas, including the coasts, as Smith had told his wife he was going fishing, but could not find a body. That's when Brady was brought to trial. In June of 1935, Holmes cooperated with the police after initially being a very difficult suspect. Prior to his cooperation, he had failed to commit suicide, and had led the police on several hours worth of police chases around Sydney Harbour. Now he told police that Brady had killed Smith, disposed of the body, and had blackmailed Holmes with his severed arm, stating that Brady would kill him if he didn't pay him £500. Following this, Brady disposed of Smith's severed arm in the sea, where a small shark consumed it, only to be eaten by a bigger tiger shark, the shark that would eventually end up in Kugi Aquarium. The Death of Grigory Rasputin Often referred to as history's most unkillable man, the circumstances surrounding Grigory Rasputin's death are particularly horrific. Born into a peasant family in Serbia in 1869, Grigory Rasputin was a Russian monk. 
who systematically managed to work his way into the ruling Romanov family of the time. The Romanovs were enamoured with the monk after he managed to save their son from illness against all odds, but the Russian people begged to differ. Rumours eventually came out in the form of news that Rasputin was the secret lover of the Tsar's wife, and that he had put the family under a dark magic spell. Before long, Felix Yusupov, the Tsar's nephew-in-law, as well as monarchists, Dmitry Mavlovich and Vladimir Pulishevich hatched a plot to assassinate Rasputin and save the Russian royal family. Much about what we know of Rasputin's assassination comes from Yusupov himself, who provided a great first-hand account of the events of the night. He arranged for Rasputin to join him at his estate, offering him pastries and wine in his cellar. This, of course, was just a ploy to get him out of the way. Before long, the monk was eating pastry after pastry, each of which was poisoned with deadly cyanide. When this didn't work, he was offered wine, which again was laced with the poison, enough to kill a small group of adult men. He took it readily, but still did not die. Leaving Rasputin alone in the cellar, the conspirators took off upstairs, where they agreed that shooting him would be the best way to end this. Yusupov finally shot Rasputin in the chest after a tense standoff, who appeared to have overcome the poison entirely when the men returned downstairs. Rasputin, now lying immobile in a pool of blood, had no pulse, and the shot had hit him in the immediate vicinity of his heart. Surely this was enough to kill the monk? Well, apparently not. Rasputin soon woke up and flew straight to Yusupov, scratching at his face and neck. Yusupov fought him off, and Rasputin fled in the direction of the door. He was shot twice while escaping, once in the head, but this still did not finish the job. While he remained unconscious, he was secured and thrown into the icy Neva River, where he ultimately died of hypothermia. The Boats Over the course of history, those in charge have devised many cruel and unusual forms of torture for those who have run afoul of the law. You can just take a look at our Medieval Madness channel to know all about that. But it was perhaps the ancient Persians that demonstrated just how creative and grisly they could be in the carrying out of justice. First practiced in around 500 BC, victims of the boats, otherwise known as scapism, would be secured inside a wooden boat or atop a wooden raft, their limbs tied to each end. These boats were then tethered with a post or pier, floating in a swampy or marshy patch of water. Victims would then be force-fed an overwhelming amount of milk and honey, to the point where their stomachs, as to be expected, could not take any more, spewing the mixture into the boat and onto themselves. This was left to fester in the sun, along with any natural waste, while the condemned's torso was coated in a similar concoction. The purpose of the milk and honey was to attract insects, large stinging ants and wasps native to Persia's warm climates. The insects would find their way to the boats, where they would cover the individuals within the mixture, stinging and biting and crawling all over them. Many would burrow their way inside the victims' still alive bodies, laying eggs and feeding from within. Due to the fact that victims of escapism were kept alive by torturers, who fed them food and water each day, this would not be a quick death, and it was likely that these individuals only died when their bodies had sustained enough insect-related injuries, or if infection took over. Aztec Human Sacrifice We have covered many of the gruesome events of history before on this channel, so some of the history buffs among our viewers might be familiar with this one. The Aztecs were a powerful civilization of Mesoamericans who existed from 1300 to 1521, native to what is now modern-day Mexico. Life in the Aztec Empire was brutal, and more often than not, short. Aztec religion stated that human blood was needed to keep their gods happy, so they would bless the land with a bountiful harvest, ensuring their people would ultimately survive. The Aztecs took their sacrifices from a number of sources. Prisoners of war were the first choice, but if they were unavailable, they would readily offer criminals, children, and those who had volunteered specially for the occasion. Sacrifice became a huge part of Aztec culture. Warriors would take great care not to kill their opponents in battle, 
preferring to capture them in order to send them for sacrifice, which would allow them to improve their social status. As for the exact methods of Aztec human sacrifice, they were particularly horrific. Often victims were walked in their hundreds up to the top of the iconic Aztec pyramids. When they reached the top, they would be forced to lay on a stone slab, with their four limbs held down by priests. One priest then plunged his sacrificial blade into the victim's lower torso, allowing him to reach in and remove the heart. The heart and its blood were then offered to Huitzilopochtli, the Aztec god of the sun, so he could consume them. After that, the dead body was tossed down the angular sides of the pyramid, with the skin was flayed and worn as a grim trophy by the warrior who had caught the sacrifice. The rest of the body went separate ways. The severed head was used in religious dances, then stored on a wall or skull rack. The flesh from the body was, in some circumstances, actually consumed by the warrior's family in a stew. The Beast of Givaudan in Givaudan, located in the south of France, between 1764 and 1767, something very strange was happening in the rural countryside that covered the region. 600 people were attacked by an unknown assailant, of which 500 were killed and 49 were injured. Many of the dead met their grisly end by having their throats torn to shreds, and many of the victims were partially eaten by what looked like a large carnivorous animal. Descriptions of the animal from the time note a large wolf or dog, and the creature was reported to have been killed many times before the death ceased to happen, leading historians to believe that it was a particular bloodthirsty pack of creatures that were doing this killing. Myths from the time state that a supernatural evil creature was to blame for these killings, but the truth, or as close as historians have got to it, is perhaps much more surprising. The most likely culprit is a pack of abnormally large, bloodthirsty wolves. But other sources point to something much stranger. A lion, perhaps one that was imported from Africa or Asia, that had escaped. One source, a book by author Marc St. Val, even claims that a pack of imported Tasmanian tigers, a species of recently extinct, predatory marsupial from Australia, might have been to blame. The Byford Dolphin Accident Imagine working a hundred meters below the surface of the water in the dead of night. Your workstation and home is a series of small chambers which are attached to a short passage tube which connects to a diving bell. Your job is to drill for oil and gas in the cold North Sea, and each day you face one of the most difficult and dangerous situations the world can offer. Immense pressure differences are taking place in the inside of the chambers against the outside of the deep ocean, and if anything in your day-to-day -day job is completely incorrect, multiple lives could be lost as a result of explosive decompression. This horror became a reality in November 1983, when four divers working on one such station, the Byford Dolphin, tragically perished in one of the most gruesome accidents in history. The Brits Roy Lucas and Edwin Coward, and the Norwegians Jorn and Trulis, perished in the horror, and as a result, as one of the two diving tenders that accompanied them, the other was severely injured. There were a series of steps that needed to be followed when a diver was returning to the chambers for the night. Firstly, the bell door needed to be closed. Secondly, the diving tender would need to marginally increase the pressure of the diving bell to allow the door to shut correctly. Thirdly, the door between the passage tube and the first chamber would need to be sealed. The fourth step was for the crew to depressurize the passage tube, and the fifth was to open the clamp up so that the bell was not connected to the chambers. This was the order of things without incident, until the 5th of November, when after completing step two, one of the tenders opened the clamp before the last diver was safely in the chamber with the door shut. As a result, the chamber, with its door wide open, was instantly crushed under the changing pressure taking the divers and one of the tenders with it. Air rushed out of the chamber, and, as the walls caved in, the divers were dismembered, violently exploding under the water. The 
the Enfield Monster. What's the scariest cryptid you know of? Perhaps it's the Chupacabra, with its menacing slender stature, or could it be Bigfoot? The idea of a second species of human-like creature in the woods surely is an eerie one. Henry McDaniel of Enfield, Illinois, might have a different opinion. At 10 in the evening, on the 25th of April, 1973, Henry was locking up his front door for the night when he heard scratching sounds on the outside of it. Nervously, he looked out of his front window and witnessed what he described to be a creature of bear-like proportions. Assuming the worst, he grabbed his gun and a torch and cautiously opened the front door when he believed the coast was clear. His recollections of what he saw are creepy, to say the least. Gazing back at him was a creature standing around four and a half feet tall, with huge pink eyes piercingly gazing back at him. It was grey in colour, stood on what Henry described as three legs, and had short, stubby arms that drooped down in front of it. Firing his gun four times, Henry caused the creature to make a sharp hissing noise before it pounded off towards the nearby railway lines. When he called the police, they discovered strange dog-like footprints with six-digit prints in the earth, and Henry was described as being rational and sober in his explanation. So what exactly did he see that night? Catalepsy One of nature's cruelest afflictions must be catalepsy. It's a nervous condition related to conditions such as Parkinson's disease, where patients experience intense muscular rigidity, an inability to move, and a dullness to their senses of pain. As the body seizes up, the patients may also struggle to breathe. They will be unable to respond to stimuli, and severely bodily functions may slow down or stop altogether. Those who have struggled with withdrawals from heavy drug use may also experience this condition. For those that suffer from this horrifying condition, it must be truly terrifying to consciously lose control of your body piece by piece as you gradually sink into immobility. Hawk Terrier was born on May 16, 1947, in Quebec, Canada. He was a highly intelligent child, but dropped out of school at an early age to study and learn the Old Testament of the Bible. He later converted from Catholicism to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Hogg was very charismatic and was good at influencing people, and eventually he convinced an entire group of like-minded people to quit their jobs and form a religious sect he called the Ant Hill Kids, named for their ant-like hard work. Terrio was their self-proclaimed prophet who went by the name Moise. By 1977, Terriel and his followers had formed a commune that was free of sin and stood for equality and unity. They were a doomsday cult whose beliefs were based on the Seventh-day Adventist church. The group made their living by selling baked goods. However, Terriel had developed a drink problem and his behavior became increasingly erratic and abusive. Followers had to abide by extreme rules, which included no contact with their families and no speaking to each other unless he was present. As his drinking got worse, Terrio started punishing his followers in more extreme ways if he thought they didn't appear devoted enough to him, or if any of them wished to leave. These punishments included beatings with belts or hammers, hanging them from the ceiling, plucking hairs from their bodies, and defecating on them. Harriot also convinced his followers that the world would end in 1979 and instructed the whole commune to relocate into the Canadian wilderness to a mountainside he called Eternal Mountain in San Jockey, where he claimed they could all be saved. But when 1979 came and went, he told his followers that time on earth and in God's world was not parallel and that therefore he'd made a miscalculation. Despite Terry Alt's increasingly cruel and abusive behavior, he still had absolute devotion from his followers, and he took multiple wives and partners, telling them that impregnating all female members was a religious requirement. Eventually, he fathered 26 children. In 1984, the group's 40 members relocated to a site near Burnt River, Ontario. By this time, Terry Alt's punishments were becoming more and more extreme, to the point he made members break their own legs with sledgehammers, sit on lit stoves, shoot each other in the shoulders, and eat dead mice, insects, and feces. 
Sometimes he would ask a follower to prove their loyalty by cutting off another member's toes with wire cutters. His children also suffered horrific abuse. They were sexually abused, howled over fires, and nailed to trees, while other children threw stones at them. Things got so bad that one of Terriel's wives left her newborn child, Elisa Lavely, outside to die in freezing temperatures to keep him away from the abuse. He also started performing unnecessary surgical operations on sick members to demonstrate his healing powers. These surgeries included injecting a 94% ethanol solution into stomachs or performing circumcisions on children and adults without anesthetic. In 1987, authorities were informed of some of the practices at the commune and removed 17 of the children. However, remarkably, Terriel faced no action for his abusive acts. Things would only get worse in 1989 when follower Solange Boilard complained of an upset stomach. Terriel decided to perform another surgery without anesthesia. He laid Solange naked on a table and punched her in the stomach. Then he performed a crude enema with molasses and olive oil before cutting open her stomach and ripping out parts of her intestines with his bare hands. Terriel made another member, Gabrielle Lavely, stitch her up using a needle and thread and got another woman to shove a tube down her throat and blow in it. Unsurprisingly, Solange died the next day, but Terriel claimed that he had a power of resuscitation and drilled a hole into Solange's skull. Then he had other members, along with himself, ejaculate into the cavity. When Solange did not return to life, her body was buried a short distance from the commune. Gabrielle, who assisted in the operation, had finally had enough. She had endured her own pain, after having blowtorches held to her genitals, eight of her teeth taken out, and a hypodermic needle breaking off in her spine. So she escaped, but for unknown reasons, she returned shortly after, because she could not live without the cult. When she returned, Terriel punished her by cutting off one of her fingers, nailing her hand to a table, and amputating her entire arm. Later, he cut off parts of her breasts and smashed her head in with an axe. After the mutilation, Gabrielle finally fled and alerted the authorities. In 1989, Terriel was arrested for assault and was found guilty for the amputation of Gabrielle's arm. He received a 12-year prison sentence. During his incarceration, he fathered four more children during conjugal visits with female cult members who remained devoted to him. However, further investigations exposed the wider abuse and Solange Boylard's murder, and in 1993, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. In 2011, Terriel's cellmate sliced him up with a makeshift knife. He did not die a prophet as he had envisioned, but rather the heinous criminal he'd become. The Cokeville Miracle There are few things worse in the world than holding children hostage in their school. Even if the kids and teachers survive, the psychological effect on the rest of their lives is enormous. On Friday, May 16, 1986, the unthinkable happened at Cokeville Elementary School in Wyoming, when ex-Cokeville police officer David Young and his wife Doris entered the school wheeling a shopping cart. Inside was an improvised explosive device. David went to the school office, handing out a manifesto entitled Zero Equals Infinity, and announced this is a revolution. Teachers were confused and baffled by Young's nonsensical manifesto. Meanwhile, Doris went from classroom to classroom, luring 136 children, six faculty, nine teachers, and three other adults into a first grade classroom. She convinced them that there was either an emergency, a surprise, or an assembly there. David entered the room with the makeshift bomb trigger attached to his wrist, threatening the group that at any time if he moved his arm, the bomb would explode. He demanded a ransom of $2 million per hostage and an audience with President Ronald Reagan, who he had previously sent a copy of the manifesto. As parents and police gathered outside, inside the teachers did their best to occupy the terrified children with games, prayer, songs, and books. But the smell from the leaking gasoline bomb was getting unbearable, so their hostage takers allowed them to open the windows. After a two and a half hour standoff, all parties were getting increasingly agitated. 
David left the room briefly to use the bathroom and attached the bomb's detonation device to his wife's wrist. Doris, who was as terrified as the hostages, started begging the teachers to calm the restless children. By this time, Doris was experiencing a headache from the escaping gasoline fumes and inadvertently raised her hand to her forehead. This unintentionally activated the trigger mechanism and the bomb exploded, severely injuring Doris and filling the room with black smoke and pockets of fire. David returned to the scene in a panic and shot his wife and a teacher before returning to the bathroom where he shot himself. All the hostages managed to escape, although 79 were later hospitalized with burns and injuries, the majority of which were severe. During the carnage, Doris's burnt body was expelled through an open window and left lying on the front lawn. Luckily, two of the three blasting caps on the bomb failed to detonate. The wires to each had reportedly been cut. Had the bomb functioned fully, the death toll would have been huge. The reason for the wire cuts is still a mystery. When the bomb detonated, the majority of the explosive force was channeled through loose ceiling tiles in the classroom roof. Additionally, the open windows acted as vents and significantly mitigated the explosive power of the bomb. It was later revealed that David Young had initially planned to involve two of his friends and his youngest daughter from his first marriage, but at last minute, they all refused to go through with the plan. His daughter reported the incident at the town hall and the two friends were later found handcuffed in a van outside the school. No charges were ever brought against any of them. All told, 79 of the hostages suffered severe injuries, mostly second degree burns, smoke inhalation, and other injuries from the exploding bomb, and many have been left with lifelong psychological scars. Only David and Doris were killed, however it could have been so much worse, and that is why it's known as the Cokeville Miracle, and not the Cokeville Massacre, because no one ever found out why those wires were cut. Felicitas Sanchez Agulian Felicitas Sanchez Agulian was born in Cerro Azul, Veracruz in Mexico. Her mother was an uncaring woman who showed no affection towards her daughter, and Felicitas grew up knowing her mother didn't love her. Her troubled upbringing contributed to her psychopathic personality and aversion to maternal feelings. As a child, she started displaying unnatural behaviors and took pleasure in poisoning street dogs. However, despite having no compassion for anyone or anything, as an adult she trained to be a nurse and midwife. She also married a local man called Carlos Conde. Together the couple had twin girls, and although Carlos doted on his daughters, his wife wanted nothing to do with them, and suggested to him that they give them up for adoption. He reluctantly agreed, but after they left, he changed his mind and wanted his girls back. However, Felicitas, who had arranged the adoption, refused to tell her husband where their daughters were, and this eventually led to the couple's divorce in 1910. After the divorce, Felicitas moved to Mexico City, where she lived in an apartment building on Salamanca Street, Colonial Roma. She began to attend births and illegally perform abortions. She also started to trade in illegal adoptions and was arrested twice for practicing unlawful adoption and baby farming. As with many other baby farmers worldwide, Felicitas would take money from the newborn's mother, promising to use the funds to care for the child until they could be found an adopted home. The truth was, she would sell those as quickly as possible, and if she did not sell the child within a few days, then she would murder it. Felicitas then dismembered the bodies and incinerated them in the large furnace she had installed for that purpose. In other cases, she would flush the body parts down the toilet, on April 8, 1941, human remains were discovered near her home, and three days later, she was arrested, along with two accomplices, her second husband, Roberto, and a plumber called Salvador Martinez. On July 16, 1941, before she could be tried for her crimes, Felicitas committed suicide. The daughter she had with Roberto was placed in state care after her father was also convicted for involvement in the murders. It's estimated that Felicitas murdered as many as 100 children, aged from newborn to three years old. Typically, she would poison or strangle them, and horrifically, sometimes she would dismember a child while they were still alive. 
It's no surprise that various newspapers named her the female ripper of colonial Roma and the human crusher of little angels. World War II Suicide Cliff Ladaran Banaduro is a cliff above Marpi Point Field on Saipan, the largest of the northern Mariana Islands in the Western Pacific. In 1919, Japan was awarded control of the island as part of its mandated territory of the South Seas Mandate, and soon after many Japanese families settled there. However, towards the end of World War II, the US planned to take the territory and on June 15, 1944, 8,000 US Marines landed on the island and the Battle of Saipan began. The naval bombardment had started two days earlier and had already weakened the Japanese defenses. But despite the Japanese soldiers being bombarded from all sides, their resistance was incredible. No amount of shelling could shake their resolve. The fighting was brutal, with many casualties on both sides. In desperation, some Japanese troops and civilians took cover in ravines, cliffs, and caves, and used them to ambush the US Marines, often with devastating consequences. In response, the Marines cleared out the caves with flamethrowers, often unaware that both civilians and troops were in them. The land, sea, and air battle was relentless, and after a few weeks, it was evident that the Japanese had lost their fight the Americans had corralled the remaining Japanese forces and civilians into the northern tip of the island, but still they refused to surrender. They had got word from Emperor Hirohito that all Japanese citizens, soldiers and civilians left on Saipan were to commit suicide rather than surrender to the Americans. This was commonplace for the Japanese during war, with their adage being, do not live in shame as a prisoner, die and leave no ignominious crime behind you. In response to the message, their general ordered the largest Banzai charge of the entire war. On July 7, 1944, all the remaining Japanese troops, including those who were injured, along with a number of civilians, charged at the American army forces in a desperate last-ditch attempt to defeat them. The battle lasted 15 hours, and almost all of the Japanese troops were killed, along with hundreds of American soldiers. The American troops were battle-weary after a month of brutal fighting, and thought their ordeal was finally over. However, sadly, some of the worst horrors they would witness were yet to come. The Imperial Japanese Army had spread terrifying propaganda about what would happen to Japanese civilians should they fall into American hands. According to them, they would expect to be raped, tortured to death, or even cannibalized by the savage enemy. The fear of this propaganda, and knowing their island was now captured, resulted in hundreds of Japanese citizens to edge towards Marpai Point, where entire families leapt to their deaths. Some parents slit their children's throats before throwing them over the edge and followed them to their demise. Worse still, groups huddled together with a grenade in the middle, blowing themselves up after pulling the pin. Others chose to simply walk into the ocean until the waves engulfed them. In a desperate attempt to stop the senseless deaths, American troops called on already captured Japanese civilians to shout over loudspeakers to reassure their compatriots that they would be treated well if they surrendered. Some chose to surrender after hearing this, but others remained stubbornly loyal in their passionate commitment to their emperor and took their lives and the lives of their families anyway. There is no official count of how many civilians took their own lives at the end of the Battle of Saipan, but estimates usually range between 800 and 1,000. The incident was one of the many great tragedies of a war that was marked by mass deaths of combatants and non-combatants alike. Today, the Okinawa Peace Memorial is located below the base of the cliff, where so many died, and the site has become a place that Japanese visit on a pilgrimage to console the souls of the dead. Whiskey Air Jameson Irish Whiskey is by far the best-selling Irish whiskey in the world. It was founded back in 1780 by a Scottish-born John Jameson, and through the years, the company has passed through the generations of the Jameson family. However, James S. Jameson, the great-great-grandson of John, brought shame on the family when he used his power and privilege to do the unspeakable and get away with it. 
In the late 1800s, James S. Jameson was the heir apparent to the family fortune, and like many rich people of the era, James used his considerable wealth to travel the world. He was an adventurous type, and would often tag along on expeditions of more accomplished explorers. In 1888, he joined the Emin Pasha Relief Expedition, led by renowned explorer Henry Morton Stanley, across Central Africa. The expedition was to take supplies to Emin Pasha, the leader of an Ottoman province in Sudan that was cut off by a revolt. However, in reality, it had a dual purpose, to occupy more land for the Belgian Free State Colony in the Congo. James was in command of the rear column of the expedition at Ribakiba, a trading post deep in the Congo, known for its cannibal population. When, for some bizarre reason, he mentioned to Tipu Tip, a slave trader and local fixer, that he had an interest in witnessing cannibalism firsthand. Tipu Tip then acquired a ten-year-old slave girl, for which James paid six handkerchiefs for, and talked to the chiefs of the village. The chiefs then paraded the girl, telling the villagers that she was a present from a white man who wished to see her eaten. The poor girl was then tied to a tree, whilst the natives sharpened their knives, before one of them stabbed her twice in the belly. Three men ran forward and began to cut up the girl's body, finally cutting off her head. Each man then took a piece away to the river to wash it and eat it, leaving not a particle behind. The extraordinary story was later recounted by the exhibition Sudanese translator Asad Farhan in an affidavit that was later published by the New York Times. In fact, in Jameson's own diary, he wrote of the incident, claiming the girl never screamed throughout the ordeal. She never uttered a sound or struggled. After the incident, James also made rough sketches of the horrible scenes and later finished them with watercolors. In his diary, he wrote, when I went home, I tried to make some small sketches of the scene while it was still fresh in my memory. After the New York Times article was published, James and his wife tried to play down the incident, saying he went along with it because he believed it to be a joke and could not imagine that the villagers would actually kill and eat a child, even though he knew they were cannibals. Sadly, it is likely the account is true, although varying accounts of the incident do exist. However, James Jameson never faced justice. He died shortly after the accusations in 1888, during a fever he had contracted during the trip. The Jameson family, with the help of the Belgian government, were able to hush up the atrocity, and to this very day, no one knows the real truth, but the hideous incident still hangs over the family legacy.